You see my screen? Yeah, yeah, screen you can see. Okay. I think Professor Hall is still trying to test. Uh, you can see my presentation file. I saw not it. Yet. Uh, oh, sorry. Page, yeah. This is not first. Yeah, page number page ten. Yeah, looks good. Yeah. I can't hear you. Professor Ha, I can't okay, hear you. Is, is everybody here? You can <laughs> hear my voice? Yes. Okay, yes. good. Uh, good. Now I think uh, we can start. Good morning. Okay, so just uh, I'll introduce uh, the chair and then we start. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Very good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. So today is the fourth day of our WhatsApp IWM7. The invited session will begin now. May I now request Professor Kyun Jaha to chair the session. And I just to give a brief introduction about her. She received PhD from Wensei University in 1992. Her main fields of study are monsoon climate, climate dynamics, and global hydroclimate change. She is currently a professor at Atmospheric Science Department, Science 1994 at Pusan National University and Center for Climate Physics, Institute for Basic Science since 2017. She was principal investigator for the Global Research Laboratory Project for Global Monsoon Climate Change. She served as president of Korean Metallurgy Society during 2022-2023, executive editor of Climate Dynamics, editor of Nature Scientific Reports, and advisor, Presidential Advisory Council, on science and technology. She has been a fellow of the Korean Academy of Science and Technology. Over to you, ma'am, sir. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> good. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Anyway, <laughs> I am Gyeong uh, chair of a session on uh, climate change and application for IWM7. All of you are very welcome there. Let me start. You can see the program that we have for invited speaker. I would like to welcome you all of, on behalf of the organizer. Let me introduce uh, Professor Bin Wang, uh, distinguished scientist, uh, yeah, on climate dynamics. Bin Wang is a professor of the atmospheric sciences of the University of Hawaii and director of the Earth System Modeling Center at Nanjing University of Information, Science and Technology. His research field is well known as a distinguished scientist on climate dynamics, atmospheric dynamics, tropical meteorology, and geophysical fluid dynamics. Specific research interest area include global and regional monsoon tropical uh, intra-seasonal oscillation and linear dynamics, climate variability, predictability, and uh, prediction, climate change, many fields on uh, related on the climate dynamics. And he was an elected fellow of the uh, American Medi uh, Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society. 
he received a Carl uh, Rosby Research Medal uh, bestowed by the AMS in uh, 2015. Anyway, let me uh, invite Professor Bin Wang. So now I would like to hand over Bin Wang. Yeah, thanks, King. Yeah. First, I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, um, I really appreciate giving me this opportunity uh, from organized committee to uh, express some of my ideas. Uh, today, I will focus on the response of the global monsoon to anthropogenic forming, uh, warming. But before that, I want to very briefly discuss the emerging concept of a global monsoon. We know the monsoon has been defined by wind in the last 300 years. However, monsoon has another characteristic, which is the rainy season in the summer versus dry winter. So, um, Bing Wang, can you share your screen? I, I thought I share my screen. No, I'm not. Yeah. I did not share my screen. You didn't. Oh, what happened? Again, you can share your you can screen. Yeah, share screen first. Okay. No. It's not. So share is screen now. Minimize this. Huh? Now put your presentation. Yes, making the full screen. Yes. Did you see? Full okay. screen, please. Full screen, please. Oh. Okay. I'm we'll try. Okay. Is that all right? Okay. That's good. Yeah. So um, we know the monsoon is characterized by annual reversal wind, but also characterized by rainy summer and dry winter. So after the OLR uh, data available, I have been trying to uh, define the tropical monsoon with OLR data in 1994. And the wind definition confined the monsoon to Asian, Australia, and Africa, but the rainfall definition extend to Southern Africa and North and South America. It's not only in the East Hemisphere, but it's a global scale. Today, if we use precipitation data and put up two criteria, the annual range is large enough and the local summer precipitation exceeds 55% of the annual total precipitation, then we have this uh, black curve outlined regions, grains line, the blue is the ocean, ocean and the land occupy about the same area. So the eight monsoon regions are showing here. And uh, so, so it shows that uh, uh, it's, it's a global scale of a monsoon uh, phenomenon. It's not just the Eastern Hemisphere. If we are taking the UF analysis of the surface wind and precipitation, the dominant mode shows this uh, hemispheric anti-symmetric during summer is in North Hemisphere white, Southern Hemisphere dry, and worse versa. So what is a global monsoon? Uh, we can see that uh, uh, climatologically, it is a dominant mode of any variation, defining feature of the Earth's climate. In physical essence, global monsoon can be viewed as a forced response of the climate system to annual cycle of solar radiation. This generic definition can apply to the paleo monsoon when the land ocean distribution is very different from today. The monsoon precipitation and the circulation consists of a system. The system is a global scale, annual reversal of three dimensional monsoon circulation, accompanied by seasonal migration of the heavy precipitation. Now, many of the people argue global monsoon change is due to migration of ITCZ or change in the hardest circulation. I want to submit that uh, an alternative view. In other words, monsoon is driving them rather than a passive stuff. 
from theory, the Gill model tells you that if you have a monsoon heating, you generate Rossby current wave response. If you make a zonal meridional average, you get this hardless circulation and also worker type of circulation. So there is no doubt about that. If you look at the observation, this upper level 200 head positive divergence wind, 70% of the rainfall falling in this monsoon region, in the right line, all the line the regions, and the heating generated upper level divergence wind flow from northern to the southern hemisphere. Webers call this lateral monsoon. This is the backbone of the hardware circulation. And Webers also point out there is a transverse monsoon, Lincoln monsoon with subtropical high or dry area. So monsoon and the desert is a couple. They have a couple of variabilities. As shown here, the black line is Northern Hampshire monsoon rainfall. And the blue line is Northern Hampshire all dry region mean precipitation. They are out of phase on the interannual time scale and in the multi decadal or trend. So suggesting the monsoon is a very powerful driving many things. Um, I want to argue that uh, the ITCZ consists of by monsoon convergent zone and the trade wind convergent zone. And the ITCZ movement is mainly due to the monsoon change during the annual cycles. In the monsoon convergent zone, you have this north-south movement ITCZ and reverse of the hardest circulations but in the trade wind convergent zone, ITCZ does not cross equator, and the hardware circulation has later of movement in terms. Of. Therefore, I argue that uh, global monsoon plays a, uh, plays a power role in driving annual variation of the ITCZ hardware circulation and the subtropical high and the desert. It also central to the global hydrological cycle. Now let's further discuss the response to anthropogenic forces. This mainly come from a recent uh, uh, monsoon specialist review panel meeting organized by C.P. Chang, uh, published in the BAMS. I also has a, a company paper to explain the future change of global monsoon projected by CMIC-6 model. I will first review 24 CMIC-6 models projected future change then discuss why there is a such change. The most robust signal with high confidence is, is the extreme precipitation increase in the future. Heavy rainfall will increase on daily to multi-day timescale and intense rainfall on hourly timescale. Dry spells will be also prolonged along with enhanced evaporation roundoff so that increase the risk of droughts. Urbanization will cause significant rise in the intensity and frequency of extreme event. Now, how sensitive is the extreme event to the global warming? Mei Chang et al. recently has a paper estimate the global land monsoon precipitation extreme event sensitivity to the global warming. And they estimate this is about 8% increase by one degree of global warming. Nearly independent regions, projected periods, or emission scenario. Now, this is very close to the 7% of uh, uh, increase in the moisture. And it's much larger than the mean monsoon precipitation change. The global land monsoon increase only 1.1 degree, 1.1% uh, per one degree seven times less. Okay. However, it is a regional varies. If you look at the local summer, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere, JJS season, South Asia, East Asia has increased by 4% per one degree global warming. It's a very likely increase. And the North Africa, West North Pacific are likely increase. However, the North American monsoon is likely to decrease. Southern Hemisphere monsoon during the local summer slightly increase, 
but significantly decrease during the winter time. So as a result, the annual mean Southern Hemisphere 3 regional monsoon basically unchanged versus Northern Hemisphere increase, especially in the Eastern Hemisphere increase versus the Western Hemisphere North American monsoon decrease. So what caused this regional difference? Well, our hypothesis is that it's driven by the un uniform uh, warming pattern. This warming pattern is characterized by northern hemisphere warmer than southern hemisphere, which of course favors northern hemisphere increase, but weakens southern hemisphere. Another feature is the land warmer than ocean, so that it enhances Asian North Africa monsoon due to this vast land area but not the North American monsoon because the land area is small compared to ocean. The third feature is El Nino-like of tropical warming. And this El Nino-like warming actually reduce the North American monsoon and reduce global monsoon in general. Now, to verify those hypotheses, we look at the intermodal spread. The axis tells that the models Northern Hemisphere warmer than Southern Hemisphere more toward the right. And in those models, Northern Hemisphere summer monsoon total precipitation is also increased more. So they are positive correlated. In other words, the Northern Hemisphere warmer than Southern Hemisphere indeed favors Northern Hemisphere monsoon rainfall. Likewise, we can show that the land warmer than ocean favors Asian and North Africa summer monsoon rainfall, also positive correlated. But the North American monsoon is linked to the equatorial Pacific warming, the El Nino like a global warming. If equatorial Eastern Pacific warm more in the model, the North American monsoon rainfall decrease more negatively correlated. So that suggests that the intermodal physics support those three hypotheses I just explained. Now, what about the thermodynamic effect? The thermodynamic effect has two aspects. One is a specific humidity. Another is a dry static stability because the greenhouse gas warming is top heavy. So it will stabilize atmosphere. As shown in this figure, the, the change, the increase of the specific humidity over summer monsoon regions, almost uniform everywhere. So is the stabilization is almost uniform everywhere. However, these two effects tends to offset each other. One is the increased rainfall. Another is surprise the vertical motion, decrease rainfall. So if you're talking about the thermodynamic effect, you should consider both. You cannot just see oh, moisture effect. So therefore, if I summarize, the greenhouse radiative forcing has two effects. The dynamic effect is basically due to the horizontal differential heating induced by this greenhouse gas. Northern hems are warmer than southern hems are land warmer than ocean, El Nino like warming. They create regional different circulation change, vertical motions, eventually affect the monsoon precipitation change. The thermodynamic effect, as I argued, the top heavy heating stabilizes atmosphere, surprise vertical motion, not favor for monsoon precipitation change. On the other hand, the increased temperature, increased moisture then they really enhance the precipitations. But this two thermodynamic effect tends to be offset each other. And uh, to summarize, how does the greenhouse gas change the globe on the region of mean monsoon rainfall? I would argue that uh, the radiative force change the mean land monsoon rainfall by increasing moisture, stabilizing atmosphere, and the changing monsoon circulation. So the regional monsoon response difference is due to circulation change, not moisture, not a static stability change. So the, the two thermodynamic effects 
offset each other. In other words, the increased moisture and the stabilized atmosphere has opposite effect. So the greenhouse gas induced circulation change, in other words, the dynamic effect are primarily responsible for the Northern Hemisphere increase, Southern Hemisphere unchanged, and the Eastern Hemisphere and North Asian Africa monsoon becomes uh, whiter, but, but North American monsoon becomes drier. So uh, all those can be explained by the dynamic effect due to the circular, uh, due to the warming pattern generates the circulation uh, anomalies. I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your excellent talk. Is there any questions or comments? Okay, Andy, Andy, it's you. No question. Okay, another person. If you have, yes, Tim. Yeah, uh, uh, very interesting talk. I just wondering, uh, seems all the changes you talk about here uh, is referred to the precipitation change. Uh, so at the most, the vertical velocity is included. But how about horizontal circulation change? Do you have any uh, results on that part? Circulation change and uh, um, horizontal and change. Yeah. I think they are they are coupled. I didn't look at the the wind change in the different regions. The the rainfall change is consistent with the low level vorticity change and upward motion change. The low level vorticity increase, for example, in the South Asia or East Asia, could be related to the Southwest monsoon increase. And in the East Asia, maybe the southern wind increase. Uh, but I don't look at the details. I think you will you will discuss that later probably. Yes. <laughs> uh, is there any? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, Bean. Okay, I have a, a question on your. Um, you mentioned the. Um, okay. Who he? Who say? Uh, you mentioned the uh, equatorial and so like warming uh, linked to the uh, North American monsoon. Yeah. How about, like. uh, yeah. How about uh, North Atlantic uh, warming and cooling can uh, moderate the North American monsoon? Uh, is some papers uh, about uh, that kind of uh, North Atlantic impacts on uh, North American monsoon? How do you compare to uh, SST warming? Uh, yes, both can affect North American monsoon. The Atlantic, I think, mainly is north-south asymmetry. Uh, north North Atlantic warming, southern Atlantic relative cooling, that can generate cross equatorial flow affect American monsoon. To some extent, also affect North American monsoon. But uh, North American monsoon region is very close to the East and North Pacific, Eastern Equatorial Pacific. Therefore, I think the warming there has more direct influence. They immediately ge generate the anticyclonic anomalous circulation over the Eastern North Pacific, Mexican, and the, the intra American monsoon region. So, so, so therefore, I I think this is a major factors, but as you said, not uh, we can we can also check whether the model of physics supports the hypothesis that North Atlantic warming has some contribution. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So let's move on next. Uh, so can you? Uh... There is, a question, there is a question in the chat box uh, from Raghavendra Achin and Sima W. Oh. So that question can be attended through chat. I can read okay. out it. What is the impact of greenhouse gas on internal variability? Sorry? 
what is the impact of greenhouse gas on interannual variability? Oh, that one, first of all, probably you have to look at how they change the SST mode because the monsoon in the interannual time scale, the largest driver is El Nino, La Nina. Uh, it affects by others like Indian Ocean Dipole or North Atlantic warming. So in order to address that questions, I think it's really need to make sure we know how the SST very <laughs> response to uh, uh, that has a lot of uncertainties in terms of the ENSO change, how the ENSO change. So I can't go in depth discussion. <laughs> I don't know whether I answer your question or not. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you. Using chatting a box, you can uh, give us some further uh, comments and uh, answer. Anyway, let's move on next. Uh, it's mine. Uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce. Uh, can you see my screen? Can see. Okay. Yeah. So my pleasure uh, to introduce you to our um, group's uh, hydroclimate uh, research on the uh, climate extremes in the hydroclimate changes. Uh, this work uh, that I will be presenting include uh, some contributions from my PhD student and uh, my collaborators in ICCP and outside. Uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, the BOMBS papers, uh, we uh, highlighted the, the intensity and extreme rainfall types different in regionally. Uh, but the uh, two third populations in global monsoon region, uh, uh, two third population live in global monsoon regions. So the fresh water can be provided by uh, fresh water from uh, precipitation. Anyway, the right side uh, the uh, figures shows the uh, the haze. Uh, so pace, some of it uh, differently changed with the global warming. So red colors changes can be uh, extended the, the earlier monsoon onset and the late monsoon retreat. Anyway, I will uh, uh, introduce uh, in my talks uh, summer monsoon change uh, duration, uh, not only uh, amplitude, uh, next is evaporative demand and evaporative deficit for the uh, drought condition uh, prediction. Another is the dynamic and thermodynamic components of late summer. The particularly, I want to emphasize the dynamic component uh, at the regional base. And then the compound heat wave with the drought condition, dry heat wave concurrently occurs in the East Asia region. Uh, how um, the length of summer rainy season and the precipitation extremes over the Asian summer monsoon domain uh, will change in response to greenhouse warming is an important question. So to address this, uh, I uh, uh, calculated, uh, performed the analysis for the uh, nine uh, reason, nine uh, regional monsoon region, Indochina Peninsula, Western North Pacific, EA, IND, India, Australia, uh, some other monsoon regions. So uh, we uh, uh, we can see the result, the changes in duration of rainy season, uh, the y axis. Uh, in terms of x-axis, DPDT, DPDT means sensitivity to the uh, uh, change in uh, temperature. So it's uh, in terms of different scenarios, uh, low, uh, low emission, middle emission, and high emission scenarios has a different uh, relationship uh, duration and uh, DPDT. So, you can see the uh, the result 
uh, as a function of the uh, relative uh, monsoon uh, change uh, and uh, monsoon duration is uh, related to the DPDT sensitivity of the global warming. The longest duration uh, is uh, represented in the Indochina uh, Peninsula, and EA and IND is very vulnerable and sensitive to the uh, this sensitivity of uh, uh, precipitation to the temperature. In terms of duration, can be changed in the different scenario. So, particularly high emission scenario, this vulnerability and relationship is highly correlated. But other monsoon reason, North America and the South America reason, seems uh, show seems uh, like the shortening uh, rainy season, uh, which are uh, very uh, distinguished from other uh, monsoon reason. So another uh, the another uh, understanding is needed uh, how the phase of regional monsoon will shift in response to the greenhouse warming. So we calculated the future change in in Pantard in different uh, monsoon region. So future warming the increase uh, and ex uh, uh, extremes in uh, light uh, figures uh, as a function of P twenty. So anyway, uh, I will explain the uh, details. Onset uh, will be uh, earlier occurred. Uh, particularly, EA is mostly uh, responsible to the uh, global warming. But uh, rate uh, literature uh, can be seen in uh, EA also. So duration is very... Uh, uh, sensitive uh, in uh, East Asia monsoon region compared to other uh, Asia monsoon regions. Uh, but uh, for example, the India monsoon uh, just uh, changes in the uh, uh, literature as a later uh, literature. But extremes, in terms of extremes in uh, P20, uh, we can see the drastic in uh, intensification in the rainfall extremes as a P20 in East Asia region. Uh, but other reason also showed the, the changes in increasing of extreme uh, rainfall. So uh, we tried to understand how uh, uh, this extreme can be occurred as a, a physical processes. So we uh, tried to understand the dynamic and uh, thermodynamic factors to induce the extreme cases. Particularly, we focused the, the East Asia region here. So particularly, the extreme rainfall uh, was found uh, in the late summer uh, compared to the early summer and late summer uh, as a, a function of the sub-seasonal scale. So we found major factors uh, as a recipe for the late uh, summer extreme uh, precipitation in the East Asia region. So uh, this uh, is, this showed the development of maintenance of both of Eurasian and uh, Pacific blocking uh, can link to the uh, this old high. And then uh, this South uh, China Sea uh, has uh, the more uh, availability of water vapor uh, with the high uh, sinking motion enhancement. So it can be uh, merged very sharply uh, uh, this reason. So it's uh, uh, narrower and uh, very sharply gradient uh, formation uh, in, uh, in water vapor and temperature can make extreme uh, rainfall. So blocking frequency and uh, intensity and also high affect the strength and location of cold air intrusion also. Uh, if we have a, a the, uh, separation of uh, dynamic components and thermodynamic components, uh, the our result show the primary factors as a dynamic factors in late summer extreme cases. Uh, 71 percent and some dynamic factors uh, 27 percent as a major component. Uh, as you can see here, dynamic components can make more uh, moderated meridional direction and then it 
uh, can be induced by heating uh, over land and ocean, different heating. And uh, some of the dynamic factors uh, uh, is more uh, generally elongated. Uh, also, this Ochuk High and South China Sea water vapor availability is uh, uh, very uh, linked to the uh, extreme cases. Another issue was the, um, the despite uh, growing precipitation, uh, future drought is one of the uh, crucial factors. Uh, it was uh, calculated with the uh, evapotranspiration deficit, which defined by the difference between the potential evapotranspiration and the actual evapotranspiration. It uh, means the uh, the water vapor availability that can be changed with the warming of atmospheric temperature condition. So uh, we defined the evapotranspiration demand as a potential evapotranspiration, and then we calculated the evaporative deficit uh, as like this uh, two figures. One is uh, middle uh, level emission scenario, and the one is a high level scenario. So future drought will become more intense. The reasonality is different. Uh, but the, we go if we go to the high emission scenario, we have a very vulnerable area in the east, the northeast Asia region and southeast Asia region. So we tried to understand the physical process uh, as a regional difference, regionality. We uh, want to emphasize the regionality. So we calculated the feedback attribution to heat wave using the coupled atmosphere surface. Uh, climate feedback response analysis method, so-called CFLM. So we divided the, the temperature change it comes from uh, the uh, net radiational heating and cooling and uh, non-radiational uh, heating and cooling, so-called dynamic heating and cooling. So water vapor feedback, cloud feedback, ozone feedback, albedo feedback, uh, as a radiational feedback and non-radiational feedback, sensible heating, latent heating, atmospheric dynamics, including advection and surface dynamic, including soil uh, dynamics. This is a result as a compound heat wave dry condition and the heat wave condition. So we calculated the uh, singular value vector uh, decomposition. The left, uh, left figure just showed the SVD1. The uh, right uh, panel showed the SVD2. So, if red colors uh, can be linked to the uh, heat wave days and uh, self uh, calibrating uh, PDSI drought index, so red colors area one uh, has a uh, very linked to the each other. So, it uh, is defined by confound heat wave area, area one. Uh, second mode showed uh, the blue boxes. Blue boxes include the Korean and uh, Japan area here, but uh, we calculated the uh, blue area only because to compare to other red uh, area and uh, blue area. So blue area defined by this area and this area. So this uh, heat waves can be concurrently occurs with the uh, drought condition. So it is very enhanced very uh, lately uh, period. So we calculated the feedback contributions to temperature change area one and area two. Area one shows the very uh, strong uh, feedback attribution in surface dynamics and uh, latent heat uh, flux. So area one has a uh, very uh, different uh, uh, feedback impact as a latent heat flux and surface dynamic processes, the positive feedback for surface warming uh, by uh, reducing the soil moisture. Uh, and then uh, area two has more uh, the, the strong uh, attribution in cloud feedback and then soil atmospheric dynamic feedback. So area two has cloud feedback lead uh, to warm climate, warm temperature anomaly uh, feedback through increasing solar insulation caused by decreasing cloud amount, uh, which is associated with the anomalous high pressure system. 
So we, uh, I want to summarize the hydroclimate changes. Uh, we emphasize the changes in pace as a duration, uh, not only amplitude. So it can be extended uh, with the global warming cases. And then intensification of extreme rainfall in East Asia is very vulnerable. And then we want to, wanted to identify the main mechanism for changes and uh, characteristics. And uh, I emphasize the drought risk from change in evapotranspiration, uh, potential evapotranspiration and actual uh, pot uh, transpiration uh, changes. Despite the growing precipitation, the future drought can be become more intense due to stronger evapotranspiration uh, transpiration demand. The, we uh, tried to understand the physical processes of hydroclimate, so we provided uh, some recipe for extreme uh, precipitation, particularly in late summer over East Asia case. We uh, provided the primary factors uh, as a dynamic and thermodynamic components. Uh, it, it was relevant to the understanding future rainfall extreme and the water vapor availability increasing. The another is the feedback attribution for the compound heat wave dry condition and the heat wave, dry heat wave. So importance of crowd feedback versus another reason has latent heat flux uh, process. So regionality is very strong in the East Asia region. So more insight uh, into the generation of a compound heat wave, droughts, wildfire, their linkage with the atmosphere waves, a surface feedback uh, should be uh, investigated in further study. Thank you. So if you have any question, you can do. Kenja, I want to ask you, how do you define East Asia monsoon onset date? You said the onset will uh, be yeah, a little, be yeah. Delayed. Basically, your definition is used, and then uh, additionally, we put uh, some criteria, uh, a little difference from your definition. So we usually uh, uh, harmonic Fourier harmonics uh, until twelve harmonics. We uh, uh, combined 12 harmonics, the first 12 harmonics, uh, uh, and then the annual cycle amplitude should be larger than the uh, second harmonics. So area is redefined from uh, your uh, uh, cases. So our uh, definition uh, showed uh, the no uh, East Asia monsoon region in the north part of East Asia. So uh, generally, the 90% area is the same as your cases, your definition. What is the mean onset date today, according to your definition? East Asia monsoon mean uh, onset date? Uh, July, late, late July. Late July onset. Yes. yes. Okay. This is the northern part of East Asia. It's not the southern part. Because South China uh, Sea is in the May. Yeah, late we May. We define the cent center of East Asia. But maybe now start in the late June. It's not yes. Uh, climatologically, today's climatology is the late June. Yes. If you look at uh, 30 degree north. Yes. Anyway, anyway, I, I think, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I have some difficulty to understand in this connection between uh, your definition of the drought. You said that you have, because uh, you, uh, when, when you said that you have more precipitation in the future, but also become more drought, yeah? The yes. reason you say is because of the evaporative demand become larger. So I yes. try to think about that. You have more rainfall, soil moisture increase, so therefore there are more evaporation uh, from surface so therefore we cost so that's the increase of demand yeah right? demand is more increased the more stiff stronger increased with mm -hmm. the warming atmospheric temperature can uh the can uh make 
more uh, water vapor availability. So winter time and uh, spring time, the more uh, evapotranspiration can move to the atmosphere. So soil is more uh, uh, drought. So uh, in summertime, the demand is larger, largely uh, more becomes larger uh, than the actual transpiration. It, this is one of the definition uh, as a hydrological view. But uh, another definition is different. Uh, so different def definition is very <laughs> different. So uh, I will uh, explain more uh, details. So another question. Kenja, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. This is Yukari. And uh, in page seven, you showed the thermodynamic dynamic di division. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I wonder why the, uh, it, it's interesting that thermodynamic part has a quite dynamic structure, like mm -hmm. cross B wave uh, propagation. So mm -hmm. why do you have such a uh, pattern for the thermodynamic contribution? Yes, yeah, thermodynamic is was defined by the change in water vapor. Uh, so gradient water vapor uh, terms show the thermodynamic factors. So I think the most important thing is uh, this uh, water vapor uh, providing from South China Sea is so more water vapor provided, but the uh, north part is less uh, providing uh, of uh, water vapor. So, uh, some dynamic components has the steep and the narrow gradients in some dynamic water vapor con conditions. So, gradient Q uh, is the main components in uh, some dynamic components. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, let me move on next talk. Next talk will be uh, Andy. So Andy uh, Turner is a professor in monsoon system funded jointly by the University of Reading. Uh, so actually his major uh, is uh, the general interest in a uh, general uh, uh, dynamics in monsoon variability, predictability, and prediction, including the interaction between monsoon system and other elements of a climate system. And Professor Turner led to in compass field campaigns to India uh, from uh, 1916, including aircraft measurement and uh, uh, many uh, work. So uh, let's welcome Andy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you see the full screen mode of my presentation? Yes, we can see. Thank you. Um, great. So um, thank you very much uh, for the uh, invitation. Um, and good uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening um, to wherever you, you are. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, climate change and the and the global and regional monsoons um, from the perspective of the IPCC AR6 report. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize that although you know my name is here, um, I'm, I'm merely the person that's delivering a talk about this subject and you know the, the work that has gone into this by a lot of people um, has 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 you know been has, has led to the findings that I'll, I'll show. Um, just to mention this nice image that we have at the frontier, um, this is a um, this is actually a merger of two photographs together, but of the same place in uh, near to Hyderabad in India, um, and it's just demonstrating the the impact of a poor or a uh, um, a good monsoon on vegetation, um, just to illustrate its importance. 
So as I mentioned, um, the IPCC report is a team, a team effort, um, and there's a very large team of people here. This was actually the last um, lead author meeting of the IPCC sixth assessment report that we had prior to the outbreak of um, COVID, and then we had to move everything online, which was a very difficult uh, challenge. Um, so there was a, a huge effort, a very large number of scientists were involved in, in writing about um, the monsoons in the AR6. Um, and particularly, I, I just wanted to mention on this, um, you can see on this on this picture, um, two um, esteemed uh, Indian scientists as well, um, uh, Dr. Krishnan and um, Dr. Swapna, um, who um, it was great to, to work with um, in this in this report. Um, so I just first want to say something about um, where the monsoon information is distributed in the IPCC um, sixth assessment report. Um, and obviously there's a, there's a lot of different chapters. Um, the first sort of set of, of information in, the, in chapters two, three and four, that covers um, the global monsoon. Um, we look at, at both the observed system in chapter two, um, attribution to change in chapter three, and then the sort of global scale of future projections in, in, in chapter four. Chapter eight, which was a new chapter on uh, devoted to the water cycle, um, that was really where the bulk of the regional monsoon um, information was, was kept. Um, uh, Dr. Krishnan, in fact, was one of the coordinating lead authors of that, uh, of that chapter. Um, and that chapter also dealt with things like the Hadley circulation, the ITCZ, and, and so on. And then there was a, a large collection of regional um, information chapters at the end of the uh, report. Um, I, was, I was an author on chapter 10, which was a sort of a methodological chapter that was linking global to regional climate change. And one of the things that we did in that was to um, talk about um, how do you bring multiple lines of evidence together to tell us something about climate change. And then chapter 11 was about extremes, and then chapter 12, starting to link towards the impacts community and making a bridge to working group two of the IPCC. Headline messages were presented in the SPM and the technical summary, and especially in the technical summary, there's a good uh, monsoons box that gives you really all of the detailed information, and I'll have a slide on that um, at the end. Um, and then there was also a monsoons annex, um, which goes into some definitions about the different regions and some of the basic characteristics that's not part of the, the main report. But the, the detailed region by region uh, information falls in, in chapter eight. Um, so straight on um, to the information from the report. Um, so slides that look like this, this is going to be figures from the from the report. And you can see here, for example, that this is figure 17 from uh, from chapter three. So chapter three dealt with the uh, attribution um, and the main and, and, and a part of that is, is also model evaluation because you need to evaluate models in order to make attribution statements. Um, and some of the main messages here are that we have a good but imperfect simulation of the present day global monsoon uh, domains. And you can see that in the, the multi-model mean picture of CMIP6 on the right compared to uh, the reanalysis and GPCP here. If you look at the um, time series of global monsoon precipitation, there's a decline um, from the 1950s to the 1980s, followed by a recovery and that's evident in both um, models and, and observations. And you can see that um, in this uh, time series on the, on the left uh, here. Um, there was also a similar decline and recovery evident in the Northern Hemisphere um, monsoon circulation. Um, and I think, if, if I remember rightly, this is the index um, that, uh, that uh, Bin Wang put together a few years ago. So the Northern Hemisphere Summer Monsoon Circulation Index. So now thinking about attribution of um, regional monsoons and specifically for um, to specific drivers, go into a bit more detail. Um, so what we've got here is a nice chart showing um, time series of the different regional monsoons in the uh, 20th century from the historical experiments in CMIP-6, and then the different colored box plots um, up here and down here um, are just the different forces such as greenhouse gases only, aerosol only, et cetera. And what we see is that some monsoons uh, feature clear opposing behavior under greenhouse gas and anthropogenic aerosol um, conditions. 
So in particular, South Asia, East Asia and Australia maritime uh, continent. So you can see there that for South Asia, just to highlight um, greenhouse gases, um, giving this um, uh, enhanced enhanced monsoon if we if we use those forcings alone and aerosols giving this uh, reduced monsoon and really the the finding um, is that um, for regions such as this um, the decline in monsoon rainfall is largely attributed to this um, uh, aerosol forcing over the over the 20th century um, so just to sort of summarize um, what's going on in the regional monsoons over the uh, 20th century, and I'm, I'm not going to read all of this out, um, but, you know, for example, South Asia, um, there's a clear weakening in the second half of the 20th century, and the assessed attribution of the IPCC report is that it's due to anthropogenic aerosols, and it's opposing the expected increase due to greenhouse gases. Um, for East Asia, it's a bit more, a bit more complex. Um, the, the drying north and wetting south pattern since the 1950s is attributed to anthropogenic forcing, but there is a component of the, um, the Pacific decadal variability positive phase has been a driver of weakening since the um, 1970s. And if we look at uh, West Africa, um, there's, a, there's a very pronounced sort of decline in recovery um, of rainfall in the Sahel. Um, particularly in the 1970s, 80s, and then a recovery up to the sort of mid 90s and so on. Um, and it's felt really that there's this combination of northern hemisphere aerosols um, and equatorial warming initially led to that decline. And then as some of the aerosols have been removed from the North Atlantic area um, due to reduced um, uh, emissions, particularly from the USA, for example, um, then there's been a, a shift back of that sort of thermal balance towards the, the northern hemisphere and a recovery in the rainfall um, since then. Um, so one of the other things that we take into account in the report is, is assessing um, multiple lines of evidence. And one of those, of course, is, is paleoclimates. Um, and we show that, um, you know, paleoclimates, so past climates have, have, are saying that, um, you know, the northern hemisphere monsoons were also stronger in the past in, in other warmer periods. Um, and that's largely due to orbital uh, forcing, of course. So what about the near term um, future global projections? Um, so this is covered in, in chapter four um, of the report. Um, and, and the main message here that we come out with for the monsoons is that the near term changes in global monsoon precipitation and circulation will be affected by the combined effects of model uncertainty and internal variability which together are larger than the, the force signal with, with medium confidence. And I'll show an example of this specifically for the, um, the Indian monsoon later in the, later in the talk. What about the long-term future? Um, so you can see time series of that here. Um, so the historical period in the black, and then these, uh, these uh, projections here under the different SSP scenarios. Um, clearly there's an enhanced, um, uh, monsoon with um, as the scenarios get get stronger, um, but also the circulation, especially in the, in, in the northern hemisphere monsoon is is declining. So based on the CMIP6 models, it is likely that the global land monsoon precipitation will increase with uh, the global surface air temperature rise. And that happens despite a weakened monsoon circulation. And we can put some some quantification uh, onto that. So um, at a likely rate of, of 1.3 to 2.4% per degree C um, global um, surface air temperature. Um, but of course, the um, monsoon precipitation responses depend on the region and emission scenario uh, used. So what about the um, projections of regional monsoons in the 21st century? So because this is regional, again, this falls into chapter eight, the water cycle uh, chapter. Uh, of the, the IPCC, you can see the different uh, monsoon regions uh, here in the box plots. Uh, we have the three different colors indicating three of the um, different emission scenarios with the greater radiative forcing in, in red. Um, and then left to right is the near term, mid term and long term. And what you can see is that there are robust and consistent increases in various regional mon monsoons 
um, under stronger emission scenarios and of course further into the into the future and that's most evident in south asia east asia and um, west africa especially um, but there is some uncertainty considerable uncertainty for for particularly for the american monsoons um, you can see that um, it's not quite so obvious that there's a a deviation uh, from zero until you get to this very strong, um, in this case, um, emission scenario. And in in Bin Wang's talk, he gave some of the um, the reasoning why why that might be uh, related to the um, El Nino like uh, warming patterns. So this is this is a, a slide that's not from the IPCC, but I thought it was an interesting thing to uh, to look at. Um, it's from a, a, a recent study by uh, Anja Katzenberger, um, and it's just to show that there is really clear evidence of, of a sort of a linear scaling of monsoon rainfall change um, with warming relative to the present day. Um, and you can see that in individual um, models on the on the left here. Um, so we've got a change in um, summer mean rainfall in the monsoon relative to present day against change in the global mean temperature um, and then that's simplified further on the right um, as a, as a multi-model mean for each emission scenario so it really is a very uh, sort of linear uh, change so one of the things the ipcc report tried to make more um raise more awareness of this time around this this assessment cycle was about the idea of low likelihood high impact events so we often we often just look at the multi-model mean um, projections, but that that can hide a lot of uh, variability and it can hide a lot of surprises that that you know might be possible. Um, and and one of those, of course, relates to the um, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Um, and and of course, if 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 that weakens, that sort of shifts the heat balance uh, southwards. Um, so this is a statement from the uh, summary for policymakers of the AR6. So the AMOC is very likely to weaken over the 21st century, um, but there's only low confidence in the magnitude of that trend. So we're not quite sure by how much. There is medium confidence that there will not be an abrupt collapse before 2100. But if such a collapse were to occur, it would very likely cause weakening of the African and Asian monsoons, so that the Northern Hemisphere monsoons and strengthening in the, in the South. One of the other things we have to think about is um, major volcanic eruptions, so super volcanic eruptions, if you like. And there was what's called a cross chapter box on uh, super volcanoes in, in chapter four. Um, and the statement here is that it is likely that there would be at least one large eruption during the 21st century. And such an eruption could reduce um, the, the global surface air temperature for several years which would decrease the global mean land precipitation, alter monsoon circulation, and modify extreme precipitation. And I was involved in, in the writing of this text, and we had to be quite careful with the monsoons because uh, the response of the monsoons to volcanic eruptions is quite dependent on the latitude, latitudinal location of the, of the eruption. So it, there's a, it goes on to state here that a low likelihood, high impact outcome would be the occurrence of several large eruptions that would greatly alter the 21st century climate trajectory compared to the things that we would normally expect from the SSP-based emission scenario. Um, so in the technical summary, as I, as I mentioned, there was a very nice um, sort of summary of what's going on with monsoon behavior um, and, and really a combination of greenhouse gas and anthropogenic forcing um, is fundamental to driving the changes in regional global monsoons, but internal variability also plays a role. Um, and this is just to highlight the example of South Asia over the, over the recent past, as I've mentioned already. Um, and, and there's the projections for the, for the future increasing. Um, and just sort of the headline statements from that technical summary. Um, Global land monsoon precipitation decreased from the 1950s to the 80s, partly due to aerosols, but has increased since then in response to greenhouse gas forcing and a component from the large scale multi decadal variability. There's some some regional messages here. Um, so a lot of the decreases in, in some of the regions have been attributed to anthropogenic aerosol during the 20th, 20th century 
And that's that sort of offset the expectation we would have had for some of these monsoons increased due to greenhouse gases alone. Um, and there's a projection for increased response of the global land monsoon rainfall in the 21st century due to warming at all time horizons and in all scenarios. Um, and just to, to add this point at the bottom, at global and regional scales, near term monsoon changes will be dominated by the effects of internal variability. So there's a lot of things I've not mentioned in the in, in this talk. Um, there's, there's intensification of the water cycle and increased heavy rainfall extremes. And Professor Hara has talked about that um, in the earlier talk, um, longer dry spells and heat waves and so on. The last couple of slides, I just want to sort of give some personal perspectives on some major uncertainties that are still there, I think, especially for the for the near term. Um, the first of those I want to emphasize is just this idea of the uh, the internal variability and the interplay between that and the forced change. Um, and this is really helped by new experimental designs. We couldn't couldn't understand this so much previously with just looking at CMIP um, database, which you know only maybe has one or two ensemble members per model. But some of the large ensembles that are available now may, may have 100 members for, for each of the historical and the future emission scenario, for example. And you can use that to try and understand how the forcing and the internal variability um, phrase together. And we discussed this at, at great length in, uh, in chapter 10 of the report. But this is the sort of the headline message um, for the South Asian monsoon. And this is from a paper by uh, Huang et al. Um, from uh, IAP in uh, 2020. So this is a, a time series of the uh, Indian monsoon uh, rainfall. And if you look out into the future, you've got this sort of multi-model mean based on these 100 members. Um, but if you look at um, the 10 driest or the 10 wettest members of that ensemble, you can see that the internal variability can either enhance or it can oppose um, and even weaken the, the monsoon out to the near term. Um, so that's something we need to bear in mind. I think one of the other main uncertainties is um, what is happening with aerosol, because aerosol, um, unlike greenhouse gases, you can you can make policy changes that have an effect on the aerosol in the atmosphere relatively quickly. You know, if you switch off your emissions, um, that, that comes with the atm atmosphere very quickly. Um, so the message here is that policy choices might help determine what happens um, in the South and East Asian monsoons in, in the near term. So this was a paper by um, Bjorn Samset et al um, in Nature Geosciences a couple of years ago. Um, so on the bottom here, we're looking at the um, black carbon and sulfate uh, aerosol projections that are used in the different emission scenarios, SSP 1, 2 and 3 here. Um, and those actually represent different types of air quality policies in the future. And you can see that some of those have sort of consistent patterns of, of change um, in, in all parts of Asia. And other parts, other, other emission scenarios have these strong, strong dipoles. And in fact, if we look at the trends over the last decade, there does seem to be this dipole of um, aerosol emissions between South and, and East Asia. Um, and naturally, there would be a, a, a different response in the radiative balance at the surface for those two regions. So that's something we need to think about. And then the very last point that I want to raise is just about the persistence of biases in, in coupled GCMs. And you know we've been studying this now for for many years, um, and the IPCC statement on this was that CMIP six models reproduce the domain and precipitation of the global monsoon over the instrumental period better than CMIP five models. However, both these sets of models still fail to fully capture the variations of the northern hemisphere monsoon circulation. And there's just this this final um, figure that I'll show. Um, from um, Bock et al. 2020, another recent paper that just shows the evolution of these biases in, in tropical um, rainfall um, in CMIP6, CMIP5, CMIP3. And if we focus on just South Asia, because it's the region I'm most familiar with, um, you can see that this, this dry bias um, with a wet bias in the Indian Ocean is still very much there. And at the bottom diagram, there's just some comparison between the high res and low res pictures from the high res MIP. Um, and you basically the message here is that 
um, at the sort of current GCM scales, merely increasing the model resolution is not an instant solution to the problem of, of this bias. Um, so I will I will finish there. Um, thank you once again. Um, so monsoons are changing in complex ways. Um, future projections of increased rainfall for the um, global and South Asian monsoon in particular, which scale with warming. Um, in the near term, internal variability is likely to uh, dominate. And especially for the Asian monsoons, aerosol pathways are, are important for what's going to happen in the near term. Um, but model biases are a long-standing issue that that needs uh, resolving. Um, so thank you very much for your for your time and attention. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Yeah, Tim, the key question is available due to time limitation. Yeah. Very, very quick question. So you mentioned that uh, for the long term, the uh, monsoon precipitation will increase, but the circulation will decrease. I just wondering what kind of circulation you talk about is vertical velocity or is talk about horizontal wind. So that 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 circulation is the um, the bin wang um, index, which, if I remember rightly, it's the it's the zonal vertical wind shear measured right across the um, sort of northern hemisphere tropics. Um, that was, I think, from the Wang et al. 2013 uh, paper in PNAS. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Let's move on. Last talk. Let me introduce Tim Lee, last speaker. Yeah, Tim Lee is a professor at the Department of Atmospheric Sciences, University of Hawaii. Uh, his research topics are primarily tropical climate dynamics including MJO and so dynamics and variability of a monsoon, typhoon, sub-seasonal to seasonal. The, it, yeah, he involved in many uh, international uh, network. Thank you. Start your sharing. Can you see my PPT? Yes. The big full screen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks for inviting me to this meeting. And I want to talk about something related to the monsoon circulation. So particularly here, I talk about South and East Asian monsoon circulation change and the global warming. So this is a recent work uh, joined by Professor Bing Wang and also Professor Ming Fangting from Columbia University and also Professor Yi Hui Ding from National Climate Center in China and uh, some other collaborators uh, published in the Science Bulletin. So let's look at this observed uh, summer circulation uh, observation and also from CMEP5 and the CMEP6 historical run. So basically, as you can see, the shading is precipitation and the vector is A50 hydropathic wing so dominant circulation in the South Asia, of course, is the Western wing, but in the East Asia is a Southern wing. So, and I, 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 if you look at the low level and the upper level zonal wing, you can also see in this blue box, you have pronounced the Western wing in the low level and the easterly jet uh, in the upper level. So they have strong vertical shear. So this is a, a, a model's performance here. So question we want to ask is how we are Asia some monsoon, particularly East Asia and the South Asia monsoon circulation, or the change and the global warming. Okay, let's look at uh, 30 CGCM from CMF6 and also 30 CGCM from CMF5. Uh, you have different scenario. We also all look at here. I only show the SSP5 8.5 and the RCP 8.5 results, and that's difference. 50 years uh, versus 50 years data. Here, 20th century is 50 years, 21st century is another 50 years. So just difference between those two. So as you can see from precipitation field, so all the region, uh, Southeast and East Asia monsoon region shows increase of the most rainfall. So this is not a surprise at all because the increase of moisture. Uh, however, if you look at circulation, the dominant circulation is increasing in the East Asia, but decreasing in the South Asia. So this is a so-called distinct response between East and South Asia. So we have increased rainfall in both regions. However, we have strengthened 
East Asia southerly wind, but with a weakened South Asia westerly wind. So the question here is what caused the different, why, why there's such different response? I cannot move. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, South Asia summer monsoon metrics. We're using three different parameters to represent in South Asia monsoon circulation change, and also three different parameters to look at the East Asia some monsoon metrics in addition to the zonal wind A50 helipascal in the South Asia monsoon and the East Asia monsoon region. We also look at the vertical wind shear by Webster Yang and also meridional wind shear uh, uh, by the Bing Wang. And here have similar pressure gradient, the east west gradient, and also meridional wind shear um, metrics for the East Asia monsoon. But no matter what kind of metrics you are using, you can see so in the South Asia, some monsoon, the circulation is all weakened. And for the East Asia, some monsoon metrics is all increased. Here you have bar showed the uh, multimodal medium and um, the dot, green dot show the multimodal ensemble mean. So now we want to understand the physical cause of those distinct uh, South Asia, East Asia circulation change. So we want to using uh, 42 CMF6 uh, Abrupted for CO2 experiments. So we have pre industrial control 100 years run, then we have abrupt for CO2, four times CO2, 150 here is wrong. So basically, we using last 50 years of this pre industrial control as control for the present climate. Then we have first year representing fast response because you have four times CO2, you have strong forcing. But the ocean response is slow. So basically, first year only show the land, fast land surface warming response. So this is a fast response. Then also we have last 50, year, 50 years result minus first year, which showed a slow ocean response. So now I have both fast and slow response. So we want to understand the physical mechanism associated with those responses. So this is the results from fast response. I have 42 uh, coupled of GCM from CMF6. So first response, as you can see, East Asia southern wind is increased, but South Asia westerly is decreasing. But for the slow response, East Asia has opposite response is decreasing. Here, South Asia monsoon still decreasing, both decreasing. So sum of these two. So this two is four CO, four times CO two experiments, forty two uh, models, but the result is consistent with the semi five and the semi six results. So you have reduced west wing in the South Asia, but they have enhanced southern wing in the East Asia. So this is a fast response, blue, red is slow response. Some, some of these two is purple. So for South Asia, some more so, you can say both fast and slow response, although dominant by slow, uh, by slow response, uh, cause the decrease of the circulation in the South Asia. However, for the East Asia monsoon, fast process is trying to enhance the uh, southern wind, but slow process is trying to reduce it. But the summation of these two still have increased, so dominant by the fast process. So what we conclude here is strength in the East Asia monsoon circulation is dominant by fast process, and weak South Asia summer monsoon circulation is dominant by slow process. So now that's one by one to understand First, we talk about East, how East Asia summer monsoon circulation is stressed in the fast response. As we know, fast response basically is due to land surface warming. So you can see this is surface temperature uh, response. So ocean temperature response, uh, almost nothing here, but mostly due to the land surface warming, particularly Eurasia uh, continent warming. So this warming can cause large scale cyclonic circulation low pressure. And this cyclonic circulation can further advect moisture and on the coast of Asia. So you can see this is CETA E and moisture, low level moisture increase along this line. This is the southwesterly flu. So, therefore, what we see here is 
in enhanced East Asia uh, southern wind is simply because fast land warming causes large scale surface low pressure anomaly in Eurasia. So, therefore, low level cyclonic flow. So, they have strengthened southerly in the East Asia. So, suppose this low pressure can also enhance the South Asia westly, but why it's not so? So, as you can see, you have westly to the northern part of India, but dominant by five degree to 10 degree here is mostly dominant by the west, uh, east and north and norm. So before we address this, let's look at uh, uh, how Chipan Plateau can add this thermal forcing due to fast response. As you can see here, now for the first year, the fast response, all the months, the temperature in the continent region, Euro Asia continent is still surface warming. However, if you look at the southern wind in the East Asia, only Warm, only increase of southerly happens in the summertime, not in the winter time. So therefore, enhanced East Asia southerly occur primarily in the boreal summer, while Eurasian land warming happens throughout the year. And the reason is because the Tibetan plateau precipitation. So here I show the East Asia summer monsoon index change delta, and here is a precipitation change in the Tibetan, Tibetan plateau. So as you can see, the correlation here is significant at 99 percent confidence level for all the 42 models. So what suggests here is Tibetan plateau heating can enhance this southern wind through induced cyclonic flow. So now, why the South Asia monsoon circulation weakened in the fast response? Yeah, as we see here, suppose it's a cyclonic circulation will cause enhance of westerly. Why westerly is in the northern tip of India, not in the southern part of the India? The reason is because Asia African monsoon. So as you can see, because you have this cyclonic escalation, so monsoon rainfall is enhanced in Africa. So those enhanced North African monsoon can induce easterly wind through gear model response. So this is the anomaly AGCM simulation, given the heating, you can see response uh, over the uh, Northern India Ocean region. Okay, why is the South Asia some monsoon circulation weakened in a slow response? This is, as we see, this is the dominant process in the slow response. So this is a look at the surface temperature in the slow response. So because the ocean SST now uh, involved, you can see air in like the warming happens in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So you have ascending motion enhanced uh, precipitation in the central equatorial Pacific and they have descending in the maritime continent. You can see the heating or rainfall is reduced over maritime continent. And you also see in the ocean, I would like the pattern in the Indian Ocean. This is also because this negative heating can induce a normally anti cyclonic circulation. That's why you have this anomaly easterly here. So that's why it caused the IOD uh, pattern. So therefore, anomaly easterly over the South Asia summer monsoon region is mostly due to suppressed heating over maritime continent associated with El Nino like the warming pattern. So now, now we further look at uh, those relationship between South Asia summer monsoon index and the SSD pattern in the Pacific. So this is from CMP5. This is from the slow response from the four, four times CO2 e experiments. No matter which experiment here, all show 99 confidence significant results show the consistent relationship between SSD pattern in the Pacific and the South Asia monsoon index. That's the westerly wind index in the East Asia monsoon region. So both CMP6 and Slow response showed a robust intermodal relationship between South Asia summer monsoon index and the SSC warming pattern. So this again, if we give the negative heating in the maritime continent due to the uh, air needle like the warming in the Pacific, then you will excite gear response across uh, this east the wind in the South Asia monsoon region. So let me summarize uh, my talk by using this schematic diagram. So basically, we believe the the South Asia monsoon and the East Asia monsoon circulation change uh, involve two step process. First is a fast response due to the quick solar radiation forcing. So you land warming quickly, <laughs> therefore you have this cyclonic circulation. So this South West flu will advect moisture into this region, cause the rainfall in the Africa and also over this region. So that's why those fast process cause the enhancement of southerly 
in the East Asia region. However, because African monsoon, which induces easterly anomaly in the South Asia, that's why westerly wind shifting northward. However, in a slow response, because El Nino like warming, through a change of water circulation, you have this maritime kind of heating, uh, suppressed heating in this region. So therefore you have anomaly anti-cyclone circulation, which will cause this as gear response to this negative heating. So therefore caused easterly wind anomaly uh, in the South Asia region. So therefore East Asia some monsoon circulation change dominant by fast land process, whereas the South Asia some monsoon circulation uh, change dominated by slow ocean response. That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Very excellent talk. So if you have a quick question, <laughs> it's due to time limitation, we have a, uh, not enough time to discuss. Okay, no question. If you have a question, you can ask uh, using the chat box. So let me, let me close uh, the session. Okay, big of roads. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank again uh, our speakers for their uh, very interesting and stimulating contribution and participants for the valuable following discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much to all our uh, distinguished chair and also the speaker for the actually. The session is very well maintained, time also, and also scientific content so for in interesting talks were there. So I thank the, the chair, Professor Kun Jaha, for nicely conducting the session, and also to all our speaker for the timely content and also the scientific content. Thank you very much. We will be back again in this hall after about uh, seven to eight minutes, 10, five local. We'll back for the parallel session. Thank you very much. Thank you.
audible yeah yeah but little low voice you can let it increase okay sir i'll try So this is UTC, this is an IST. So shall we start now? Hello, sir. Now it's okay for me. Volume. Yeah, yeah now it's okay. Now your sound is actually okay. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, sir. So once uh, once again. Very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you for our uh, parallel session of the day four. And now I will request uh, Dr. Suspita Joseph, scientist and head of IMPO in IATM. She is looking after this extended forecast component of uh, IATM. We are working jointly with IMD to kindly chair the session. And uh, you have we have time till eleven thirty for this session, and one presenter is not there. So accordingly, you can just uh, see the time timing, and you can give one or two minutes extra to each person. Over to you, Dr. Susmita. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Dr. Patnaik. Uh, first of all, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So without much ado, we will uh, move to the session. So we have the theme of the session as regional monsoons. Uh, as Dr. Patnai told, uh, we have five speakers in line in this. So, uh, since one speaker is not there, so we have instead of 10 minutes, we can have 14 minutes for the presentation. And uh, at around 12 minutes, I'll alert the speaker uh, so that they can wrap up in two minutes. So, now I'm requesting uh, Dr. Amida Prabhu, the first speaker, to give her talk on influence of Eurasian snow, Atlantic SST, and Arctic oscillation on summer monsoon rainfall variability over the northeast regions of India. Dr. Amita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Sushmita. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Amita Prabhu. I'm from Indian Institute of Tropical Metrology. And uh, I would like to uh, present uh, today uh, on the topic influence of Eurasian snow, Atlantic SST, and uh, Arctic oscillation on summer monsoon rainfall variability over the northeast regions of India. Uh, as we see in this particular figure, uh, India's northeast sector is considered as a separate macro region uh, within the Indian landmass. Reason being the rainfall, as we see, is mostly out of sync with the rainfall pattern over the rest of the country. The most dominant mode of variability in summer monsoon rainfall Dr. over the Amita, Yes. Uh, can you please make it full screen? Yes. Is this okay? Yeah, fine, fine. Okay. So the rainfall pattern over northeast India is out of uh, sync with the rainfall pattern over the rest of the country. This region is close to uh, Northern Hemisphere mid-latitude jet stream location, and therefore uh, it implies that the large-scale variability of mid and subtropical latitudes may have an influence in predicting the rainfall pattern over the northeast region uh, over India. This particular figure is of uh, Composites of southern annular mode, which is a uh, annular ring pattern over the southern uh, hemisphere, wherein we do see that uh, we have uh, re subdued rainfall over most part of the country, whereas uh, rainfall of opposite signature is seen over the northeast and the equatorial region. This may be due to the 40 day equatorial mode, uh, intraseasonal uh, monsoon mode, which is persistent over Indian uh, longitudes during JJS season. So motivation of this study is to investigate the role of high latitude modes like Arctic oscillation and Eurasian snow with 
the northeast indian summer monsoon rainfall further to examine the physical mechanism linking this higher latitude modes with the rainfall pattern so basically the uh, for data and methodology uh, we have extracted data from scanning multi channel microwave radiometer and special sensor microwave imager data snow data uh, and uh, the rainfall has been taken from imd ncc data uh, uh, for carrying out the teleconnection kind of studies here we do see uh, then when we uh, for the period 1979 to 2007 when we take a correlation pattern between the uh, jjs summer monsoon rainfall over northeast india with the snow eurasian snow we see a inverse correlation over the most of the eurasian domain likewise for the month of january snow when we take sst correlation uh, over the northern hemisphere we see over the atlantic ssts we have inverse correlation further down when we take for the summer simultaneous correlation with ssts with uh, monsoon rainfall over northeast india we see a positive correlation pattern the this areas have been uh, taken for uh, just for a clear view in the in the following uh, slides so we restrict with only this areas uh, but before that just to understand the dynamics between the physical mechanism how the arctic oscillation is playing a role we we'll first try and understand what is arctic oscillation it's a back and forth shifting of atmospheric pressure uh, between the arctic and the mid latitudes having centers of action over the north pacific and the north atlantic so the arctic oscillation is basically a ring like structure however it has its polarity uh, it either uh goes into a high polarity index mode or a, a low polarity index mode so when it is uh, when the arctic oscillation index is negative there tends to be a high pressure in the polar region uh, marked by high polar low and a uh, mid -lat uh, latitude low uh, when this occurs we have weaker zonal winds and greater movement of cold frigid air uh, into the mid latitudes from the polar region however when we have a positive phase of arctic oscillation index the surface pressure uh, is just opposite to that of what we have for the negative phase and here the mid latitude jet stream uh, blows strongly and is consistently uh, locked towards the polar region so there is no uh, movement of air mass and momentum from uh, higher latitudes to the mid latitudes so having understood these entities we try to formulate the hypothesis which states that when we have an excess uh, snow in the month of january which is winter time it uh, gives uh, or it uh, it leads to a negative mode of arctic oscillation so when we have negative mode of arctic oscillation excessive uh, winter snow uh, which leads to negative mode of arctic oscillation uh, we have uh, it induces a meridional wave kind of pattern uh, having uh, its descending mode over the uh, atlantic region so uh, this is associated with the cold ssts of the atlantic uh, ocean so once we have this uh, ssts in the month of uh, january during winter time it persists uh, to uh, uh, till june of the ensuing uh, year uh, the cold ssts then uh, gives rise to zonally uh, perturbed waves anomalies having a descending mode over the Uh, northeast region over india leading to weak monsoon rainfall so this is the hypothesis which we try to see in the further slides earlier study by timo bima has shown that reduction in sea ice cover over the arctic which is uh, declining at an alarming rate of uh, around 13% per decade has increased the heat flux from the ocean to atmosphere in autumn and early winter further this sea ice decline has led to uh, patterns Uh, atmospheric patterns resembling the negative mode of arctic oscillation so post 1980s we have seen an increase in the negative phase of arctic oscillation further large scale pressure patterns uh, including high over eurasia which favors cold winters in europe and north in, uh, northeastern eurasia has been linked to the falling summer precipitation both over eurasia and asia so having understood these patterns which were already studied earlier what we have done is we have understood uh, try to understand how the geopotential patterns are uh, at a higher level that is at 200 hpa for various seasons so as uh, known earlier we see that for the for winter season that is djf 
there we have a subpolar high and a mid latitude low when we take the uh, consider the negative cases of arctic oscillation so uh, basically uh, uh, when we consider all seasons it's the winter time which has dominant modes of arctic oscillation further when we come uh, and check out for the arctic oscillation for the month of january which is uh, the uh, the month where we have seen that the snow has been correlated with uh, northeast indian summer monsoon rainfall and the ssts over the atlantic uh, region we what we see is that for the uh, month of january the arctic oscillation is predominant uh, uh, right from surface till 200 hpa with maximum uh, magnitude uh, over the higher atmospheric levels at 200 hpa so we clearly see uh, that we have a subpolar high and a mid latitude low which is uh, dominant and this gives a signature for the winter time season of dgf now coming uh, to understand how uh, the snow in the month of jan and surface temperature acts uh, so uh, it is seen that we have a negative correlation between uh, snow excessive snow uh, which leads to um, cold temperatures uh, further down when we see the association between january snow and the arctic oscillation whether the snow over eurasia has a role to play uh, or is associated with arctic oscillation uh, simultaneous for the same month we see an inverse correlation which means excessive snow may give rise to a pattern of negative mode of arctic oscillation so what happens when we have a negative mode of arctic oscillation we, we take uh, for over the atlantic region averaged over the atlantic longitudes 60 west to 10 east uh, when we take a composite analysis for the negative modes of arctic oscillation we see a subpolar high uh, at around 65 north with a subpolar low at around 45 north so it is a typical case of negative mode of arctic oscillation wherein uh, we have a subpolar high and a mid latitude low in this case what we do see is over the tropical uh, northern longitudes over the atlantic region we find a descending mode over the arctic oscillation uh, taking a correlation uh, the lead like correlation pattern just to understand whether it's the atlantic ssts or the snow uh, which leads the other what we see is an uh, an evolutionary pattern for, for for correlation between ssts and gen uh, snow uh, over the eurasia we see the an inverse correlation which is maximum in the month of january so the uh, january snow and the atlantic ssts in the month of uh, uh january winter time shows a maximum inverse correlation so we just wanted to know whether the cold ssts uh, which we see in the month of jan has a persistence effect up till the following summer so when we take an auto correlation analysis of january ssst over the same area that is 60 west to 10 degree east uh, uh equator to 20 north we, what we see is that the uh, the correlation persists up till uh, the following summer so the cold ssts when we take uh, the zonal atmospheric circulation patterns for the extremes of ssst over the atlantic region we see uh, the cold ssts to be favored by a zonal atmospheric circulation with a descending mode both over the northern atlantic as well as the uh, northeast sector uh, 90 degrees uh, east of 90 degrees east finally when we take uh, the precipitation uh, composite of uh, northeast indian summer monsoon rainfall during jjs uh, for the ssst ex extremes negative ssst cold ssst extremes we see that the rainfall pattern over the northeast sector to be uh, largely uh, below normal so to summarize uh, what we do see in this particular study is uh, while there have been many predictors for predicting the indian summer monsoon region as a whole uh, substantially uh, there has been very less uh, study uh, wherein predictors for the northeast indian summer monsoon rainfall has been seen so this is one of the studies which demonstrate influence of low frequency winter time eurasian snow forcing on uh, northeast indian summer monsoon rainfall through the arctic oscillation and atlantic ssst uh, bridge in a sense while uh, the summer monsoon rainfall over major parts of india excluding the northeast region appears to be related with events over the southern hemisphere for instance the southern annular mode the enso the variation of uh, northeast uh, indian summer monsoon rainfall appears to be related to ev events which are predominant over the northern uh, hemisphere 
coming through Arctic Oscillation, Eurasian Snow, and the Atlantic SSTs. So this uh, work has been published in Climate Dynamics, wherein references cited in this uh, PowerPoint can be found in this paper. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amita, for uh, keeping your presentation in time. So now, uh, if anyone has any questions, they can um, ask that. I don't see any questions in the chat also. So if there are no questions, then we can move to the next speaker. So the next one is by Mong Min Du uh, on the decadal changes of the early summer Asian monsoon and the South China Sea tropical cyclones during the years 2001 through 2020. Uh, we have a recorded presentation. I request admin uh, to play that presentation. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So you join, so you you would be uh, doing it on your own, right? Yeah, if possible, I think it's more convenient to 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 play it from your side because it's, I'm not so. Okay, fine. Okay, yeah, please. Ma'am, uh, shall I start the presentation or the recorded video? Yeah, please play it. I cannot find my file from my from my side. It's, I'm not okay, so familiar. Okay, I can operate either presentation or recorded video. Which one you prefer? Yes, thank you. Please. Oh, sorry. So, so should I? So, so I, I start to present, or you uh, play the song. Yeah, you can. Uh, so this is recorded, right? Yeah, this is recorded. So there's a song. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Because so I don't know how to. Oh, sorry. Uh, admin, uh, the sound is not there. Audio is not there. Okay, so so how could I do it here? So. Yeah, you can. Because I try to share, but I cannot find the. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's. Okay, ma'am, I'm resharing the video. One minute. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Mommy Lu. My talk is about the decadal changes of the early summer Asian monsoon and the South China Sea tropical cyclones during the recent uh, two decades. Uh, this work is done with Dr. Cho and uh, Professor Sui at the National Taiwan University. The results were already published. Please refer to the journal article if you are interested. The TC genesis frequency over the western North Pacific and the South China Sea shows distinct Decadal scale variations during the monsoon transition season of April, May, and June. 
you can see the ups and the downs of the Genesis frequencies. The past decade was the most inactive decade of April and May TC Genesis since the year of 1960. From the climatological TC passage and the Genesis location maps, we can see the rapid increase of TC activity from April to June. We selected two separate regions to summarize the monthly TC frequency. One is over the northern South China Sea, and the other is the vitamin C and the Western Pacific. It turns out that uh, the period from 2010 to 2019 is the quietest 10 years with no TC activity in May within the South China Sea box. On the other hand, the TC activity over the Philippine Sea and the Western Pacific box also shows a a decrease in tendency since the year of 2000. But the decadal contrast is less sharp than the South China Sea. The suppression of TC activity over the South China Sea uh, was not detected in June. The decadal difference in the passage frequencies uh, further demonstrate the unique feature of the inactive South China Sea TC activity after, two, after 2011. The TC activity were actually more active in June over the South China Sea and the Philippine Sea during the recent decade. So in this research, we want to answer two questions. First, how is the TC activity over the South China Sea in May related to the development of the Asian summer monsoon? To answer this question, we will examine the contrast between the quiet and the active decades. Second, what are the inferential large scale factors responsible for the decadal changes? Our focus is on the low level winds over the South China Sea and the SST zonal gradient between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. The data we used include the ERA5, GPCP, OAR, ERSST version 5, and the Tokyo Typhoon Center TC based uh, track data. The climatology of the monthly wind and the precipitation shows the intensified uh, cross equatorial flow over the Indian Ocean from May to June. In the same time, the tropical easterlies blowing from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean become weakened. Rainfall in the monsoon region increases sharply during the developing stage of the summer monsoon. As you can see here, the month of May is a critical time during the transition. The climatology of monthly tendency from April to May clearly shows the intensification of the westerlies from Indian Ocean to the Pacific and the northward rainfall movement in the Asian Australian monsoon region. During the first decade of this century, the April to May tendency is stronger than the previous two decades. However, after 2011, the tendency became weaker. Over the South China Sea, the April to May tendency is the weakest one during the last uh, decade. We also noticed that over the Indian Ocean, the April to May tendency shows a pattern resembling the double ITCZs. It suggests that after 2011, the ITCZ during May over the South Indian Ocean was stronger than before. The low-level wind and SST anomalies in May 
during the earlier dec decade show strong cross equatorial flow over the uh, Indian Ocean. The anomalous westerlies penetrate from the Indian Ocean through the South China Sea uh, to the Pacific. Over the South China Sea to the Philippine Sea, we, we see a trough oriented in the direction from northwest to southeast. It reaches the deep tropics to the north of New Guinea. An anomalous cyclonic circulation uh, or covers the South China Sea and the mid-latitude uh, Western Pacific to the southeast of Japan. It has been previously pointed out by many papers that uh, the Asian summer monsoon onset was advanced since mid-90s in the past century. Indeed, we see the anomalous OAR and the 200 millibar wind and the stream function, showing that tropical convection is anomalously strong over Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal, southern part of the South China Sea, and the Western Pacific Whirlpool region. The anomalous patterns during the second decade are very different from the first one. The anomalous cross equatorial flow over the Indian Ocean was weakened. Over the South China Sea, we do not see the anomalous westerlies from Bay of Bengal. Instead, we observe the anticyclonic circulation uh, anomalies over the South China Sea. On the other hand, the middle latitude cyclonic anomalies to the south of Japan persisted in the second decade. The anomalous OAR and the upper level wind also shows sharper land and sea contrast uh, over, the, over, South China, over South Asia. It suggests a possibility that during May, if the monsoonal flow is weaker, the land precipitation may also become weaker. Over the Indian Ocean, we see enhanced convection on both sides of the equator, but not over the uh, not but not over the equator. The similar pattern also appears over Southeast Asia, which shows suppressed convection to the north of 10 degrees and enhanced convection in the deep tropics. Based on the anomalies, we can conclude that the advanced onset of, of the Asian summer monsoon did not continue from the first decade to the second one in the present century. The suppressed convection is also consistent with the unprecedentedly inactive tropical cyclone activity over the South uh, China Sea. Now I want to show you the difference between two decades in terms of the low level wind and the SST during May. Here we see the enhanced anticyclonic circulation over South China Sea and the, and the South, South Asia. So the weakened monsoon uh, westerlies of the uh, North Indian Ocean. The South China Sea monsoon westerlies during May has a strong decadal scale variability. During the period from the mid 90s to early, 20, uh, early 2000s, the westerly anomalies were in positive phase, which means the summer monsoon flow in May is stronger. After the year of 2010, the westerly anomalies changed to the negative phase. So the monsoonal flow became weaker in May. The zonal wind shear over South uh, China Sea that were often used to represent the cyclonic circulation strength confirms the decadal variability. The phase transition occurred around 2010. And after 2013, the anticyclonic circulation persisted to the end of the second decade. 
the statistically significant decadal difference in OAR and upper level winds show enhanced the tropical convection to the south of the equator during the recent decade. The anomalous upper level cross equatorial flow emulated from the enhanced convection centers suggests that it can contribute to the suppressed convection over the subtropics in the northern hemisphere. We compared the development of Asian uh, summer monsoon during these two decades in the time and the latitude cross-section of the precipitation and the low-level winds over the longitudinal bands covering the East uh, Indian Ocean, the Indonesian mountain continent, and the Western Pacific Warm Pool region, respectively. The northward movement of the major rain band can represent the development of the uh, summer monsoon. We see the advanced uh, monsoon onset in all three regions during the first decade. However, during the second decade, uh, we do not see the advanced uh, onset we see the dry signal over the South China Sea and the persistent wet signal to the south of the equator. So finally, I'd like to point out that interannual var variations of the South China Sea low-level wind, wind shear anomalies are highly correlated with the off-equator SST zonal gradient between Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. Their 40-year correlation is 0.59. Therefore, the strong SST zonal gradient between the extremely warm Indian Ocean and the less warm Pacific Ocean may be an important contributor to the anomalous anticyclonic circulation over the South China Sea. So here is the conclusion of the points I, uh, I just mentioned. So thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you and sorry for, for, <laughs> for the trouble of the managing the file. Yeah, thank you, Momin. So yeah. if we have any questions, the uh, participants can directly ask the questions. I saw a question. Is is this for me? For me, like uh, there's a question in the chat box saying that uh, for which model you give, we are more uh, weightage for the daily rainfall. So, uh, my presentation, I did not analyze the model data. All all the uh, presentation here, I presented the observation data. And for the daily of uh, rainfall, we use the CMOF data, and the, for the for for the monthly and the pentad, we use the GPCP. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if there are no questions, uh, let's thank the speaker, and move on to the next speaker, uh, Rahul Singh, on the investigation of drier intrusion over India during break phases of summer monsoon. Dr. Rahul. Uh, Ma'am, there is a small correction. I'm a PhD student. Okay, so, fine. Yeah. So okay. you can just uh, start your talk. You please share the screen. You have okay. 12 minutes for the presentation. Uh, okay. Means 12 minutes, I'll alert you. So, okay, thanks. Ma thanks. Yeah. Please share the screen. Uh, Ma'am, is my screen is visible? Yeah, please make it full screen. Okay. Uh, so, is my screen is visible now? 
Yeah, yeah. Please start. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so hello everyone. I'm Rahul Singh. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Center for Atmospheric Sciences, IIT Delhi. So my talk is to further for the today, today conference is uh, investigation of dry air intrusion over the Arabian Sea and its implication on or Indian summer monsoon. So. Okay, so let's get started with the introduction and also it's a kind of motivation also. So like uh, maybe as you all know, like the drought of the uh, 2002 was the third largest in the past 100 years uh, after 1918 and 1972 uh, uh, as, as reported by the BART 2006. Uh, and also like similarly, like for the year 2009 also, uh, like it was a major drought year. Uh, for the Indian summer monsoon, uh, like a, with the with a seasonal deficit of rainfall by 21.6 percent, and also like there are uh, similar studies like has reported like standard oceanic predictors such as ENSO and DIOD uh, basically are not consistent for the respective prolonged uh, prolonged dry spell for the year, for these years, and, and like also like it is important to know the processes associated with such long draws since as various statistical and the dynamical models often fail. To predict drought monsoon conditions. So actually, uh, what happened during the years 2002 and 9? So, so like some of the studies, like but and and the Christian Murthy at all, has reported like uh, uh, basically the main cause of these dry year intrusion. Uh, uh, these dry spells basically is is for uh, is a dry year intrusion basically. So like as as we see like but 2006 has reported like very dry northwesterly winds capping the monsoon inflow over the Arabian Sea. Is the cause of dry monsoon year over 2002, and particularly in the month of July. Similarly, uh, like uh, Krishnamurti uh, at all uh, 2010 has reported, like like formation of the blocking high over Western Asia, uh, which eventually leads to advection of descending very dry year towards Central India, was attributed to to the cause of this prolonged dry spell in the month of June. So the thing is, uh, uh, so the uh, in this study, I would like to uh, examine basically. What are the main uh, link between the dry air intrusion and the and the and the dry spell? So, like, uh, if we go for the uh, uh, data and methodology section, so here uh, first we are going to calculate the break even. So, so, so here I had uh, uh, calculated the break even following the following the method pres prescribed by the uh, Rajivan et al. 2010. He has stated like uh, break events are the period in which the standardized rainfall anomaly. Less than minus one for at least three consecutive days. So, like standardized rainfall anomaly is calculated by just averaging the daily rainfall using IMD data uh, and, uh, or the core monsoon zone. Uh, so, like, uh, like, like from this index, we, we actually get the uh, break events. Uh, so, like, the question arises uh, let, let these break events are actually uh, supported by the drier intrusion activity or not. So, like, uh, like for the dry air intrusion activity, we had developed an index. Uh, so, so as you can see in the right, uh, at the right hand side panel, there is a, there is a red box here. Basically, in this box, we, we had actually uh, demonstrated the dry air intrusion index. So, what is the dry air intrusion index? So, so dry air intrusion index is a function uh, of the uh, of the of the zonal wind and the moisture deficit so what is the moisture deficit so moisture did, uh, if we if we able to calculate so what is the moisture moisture deficit is defined as a difference between saturated specific humidity and the specific humidity so actually it signifies the dryness actually and, and if we multiply with the uh, if, we, if we get put it with the zonal wind so actually we actually get a transport so like uh, like if we uh, so from this uh, 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 u into qd like the moisture if we if we uh, uh, what called it, if we vertically integrate from 950 hectopascal to 300 hectopascal uh, uh, this moisture deficit transport so, so so we get an index so what is a dryer so, so how can we define a particular break event can be associated with the dryer intrusion activity so a dry year intrusion episode is defined as uh, when the DAI, like when the index, when the dry year intrusion index is greater than zero for at least three consecutive days, and also like if the DAI less than zero throughout a monsoon break phase, then such breaks spells are considered as free of dry year intrusion. Like if you want to know further about this 
analysis and uh, uh, so, so, so uh, you can all refer to our recent paper in uh, publishing climate dynamics uh, here so like uh, let's let's go like like now we are now we are having a break events which which are supported by the intrusion activity or not so now we are going to the analysis part so here uh, uh, we are showing the results so so the results are like this uh, uh, like most of the break is first during summer monsoon like it, uh, here we choose the cold monsoon months like july and august only uh, over india found to be in close coincidence with the dry dry and frozen activity from northwest india also like uh, we found that there are uh, like uh, that that there are 34 events of break spell that actually coincide with the intrusion activity while only four events uh, like are not with the intrusion activity so like uh, <coughs> so so the, the thing is like uh, if we see that the most of the dry spell are governed by the intrusion activity like uh, and then also we, we, we had did the analysis for the 34 years like 1981 2014 uh, using the era interim data set so so like also like uh, uh, we noted that during the cold monsoon months like a washed reservoir of moisture moisture deficit here at a50 at the past then, actually exist over the northern and the western arabian sea and actually which eventually act as the primary source of dry air during this period so like as you as you see here i had uh, uh, here as you see a, a composite of the all the 34 events for the in intrusion and the four event for the for the no intrusion so like if you see a clear uh, uh, clear moisture uh, uh, moisture deficit lies over the northern and the western part of the arabian sea in both uh, the cases but the but the thing is over the intros and like if, if you if you see if it's such a clear transport uh, from the northern arabian sea to the continental india while in the no, no while in the no intrusion case it, it was not transported so like <coughs> uh, so, so so like if you see uh, uh, what are the factors which is which is responsible for the transport of this dry year so the and also like i would like i would like to highlight highlight is, Moisture deficit may serves as a better parameter to measure the dryness in the atmosphere than absolute moisture content. Or so further, we have identified like that that during drier intrusion activity, uh, monsoon low level jet actually act as a primary carrier in transporting the dry air to continental India during big break phases of the Indian summer monsoon. So, so like uh, as we know, like in the active phase at uh, the active phase of the monsoon, like the uh, that the monsoon low low level jet actually transport the moisture to the continent in trend yeah, similarly in the break it, it actually transport the dry air so further like uh, like if we if we uh, here i had shown a lead lag composite of uh, of, of the daily sst like uh, here what is the t naught uh, if we go <coughs> here basically the t naught is the onset of the dry air into an activity so like if we uh, if we able to see like like uh, a positive SST gradient can be seen uh, between 15 degree and 25 degree north like here if, as you see here uh, from four days prior the onset of the drier intrusion so so you, so you can see a clear like this SST gradient actually can support a local intensification of the low level jet over the northern arabian sea uh, and also like if you if you go forward in time you, you can see the magnitude of the of this positive SST gradient is also seen to be weakening with time that may be due to the feedback effect of the increased zonal winds in the northern arabian sea so like uh, uh, here i have demonstrated the empirical or turbulent function analysis uh, so as as we all know like if for uh, for knowing the intrinsic modes present in the data so we should use the if it's a very classic technique empirical or turbulent function analysis so here actually uh, if you see in the, in the left side panel here actually uh, we, we, we performed the uf analysis to actually uh, know the variability of the low level jet so here i performed the analysis for the year to, to, to 2009 on the Z, on the daily zonal wind anomalies so like as you see uh, here there is a uf1 and the uf2 so like if you if you if you see the uf1 actually if you see it, it, it it represents the sharp and the intense intense low intense low level jet over the peninsular india which which typically happens during the active phase of the monsoon but if you see here the uf2 it, basically it shows a weakening 
uh, weakening of the southern Arabian Sea and the strengthening over the northern Arabian Sea. So, so here, here we are uh, actually uh, with this the, with this analysis we can say like with the with uh, that the UF two respond to the break conditions of the monsoon. Then then actually we we had compare. Uh, 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 we have compared the PC2 actually the, from the UF2. We, we have compared the PC2 also the uh, break even index or also the, our DAI index. So as you see for the year 2009, uh, like like all the all the parameter agrees like uh, like the last week of the July to the approximate first week of August, there is an intense break phase of the monsoon. And also, like if we, uh, from this analysis, we, we, we can able to see like, like the DAI index is clearly capturing the break phase. So, like uh, what we did in the uh, as shown in the figures is we actually uh, regress uh, the moisture deficit vectors uh, on the PC2 of the daily zonal build anomalies at a 50 hectopascal. And then, and here you can easily show like that this regression pattern show a statistically significant transport of very dry year uh, to, towards towards northwest india so we can here we can see like uh, like the pc2 actually uh, is is governs uh, like like the uf2 basically governs uh, the the trans break phase of the monsoon because as you see clearly significant uh, significant fraction of transport of dry year has been seen on on this figure 6 so so after this uh, 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 I analyze with the since we know uh, like in the in the atmospheric motion we actually know the uh, we actually want to know the thermodynamics behind this. So for this isentropic analysis is a very popular tool to understand the thermodynamical process involved in atmospheric motion. Also, and so here actually what we did we did actually we transformed the specific humidity fields at isobaric levels from era entry analysis data set to 316 Kelvin isentrope. So why uh, why we choose 316 Kelvin isotope from because it, it, it actually represents the dry lower troposphere as reported by Sabin in Poly 2020. So what is isentropic levels? Isentropic levels are defined as the level of constant potential temperature surface. So, so Rahul, you have uh, two minutes left. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so so here as we see. Uh, as we see here in the in the specific humidity anomaly pattern and 316 Kelvin isentropic levels. So here you can easily see uh, there is there is a uh, eastward pr propagation of its negative value. So you can see a very dry, a dry a very dryness, a dryness is propagating eastward. And also there is one significant thing which which was observed from this figure, like like the most of the drier intrusion, uh, drier act activity actually uh, coming uh, from the northern Arabian Sea. Uh, and only a small contribution comes from the West Asia, West Asia. So here we actually in the last previous studies as reported by Krishna Murthy et al. And the but actually they showed that the most of the contribution comes from the West Asia. But in this study we actually argue like actually most of the country contribution is coming from the Arabian Northern Arabian Sea or Western Arabian Sea part. And also, like yeah, here, we have constructed the vertical st structure of the equivalent potential temperature anomalies to understand the much better the stability of the of the atmosphere. So, so here uh, in the panel, we we actually uh, did the uh, analysis for the uh, over the northwestern India and the B over central India. So here you can see in both the figures, like there is an increase in thermodynamic stability over the northern India. During an intense dry year intrusion period uh, between 850 and 700 hectopascal, if, if you clearly see, uh, and like uh, like if you see in the both the plots, uh, actually this was there, but but in in over central India it, it was slightly weaker. So what is so so after this like it might lead to one saturation of the atmosphere of the boundary layer, and it must cause in reinforcing the break condition of the continental India. So so from this there is a summary. So uh summary of, of this like lecture like huge reservoir of saturation deficit air like uh, like if you say that dry, dryness air exists over the western and the northern arabian sea during the summer monsoon season and also like if you see the monsoon low levels that that transport the moisture to continental india in the active phase of the monsoon transport the dry air to northern and central india during the peak phases also like if you see the uh here the low the monsoon low, low level jet undergoes a weakening and broadening during the monsoon break phase. And the broadening of the low level that leads to intensification of zonal flow 
in the poleward flanks and a weakening at the core. Uh, and this uh, development of the positive melatonin gradient over the Northern Arabian Sea favors an increase in the low, low level sonar flow in the north, which actually advocates the moisture deficit area across Northwest India. Since the, this drier intrusion results in enhanced static stability over the Northern and Central India and a strong suppression of convection. Also like further, further the point is like that, this enhanced st static stability weakens zona flow from the Northern Arabian Sea region and leads to the demise of the dry air intrusion. Thus, uh, from this we can say like this internal mechanisms basically are responsible for the dry air intrusion over India and its termination during the break phase of the summer monsoon. Also, uh, here in this study, we would like to highlight like further a cause effect relationship between dry air intrusion and the monsoon break phase is not clear. Like, like here, like both the both the things are happening like at the same instant. So, so, uh, so we, we can't clearly have a cause effect relationship between dry air intrusion and the monsoon break phase. So, okay. so thanks for the listening. Okay, thank you, Rahul. Uh, there is some question in the chat box. Can you see that? Give me a moment. Ma. You can answer. Okay. Yeah. Is LLG core axis shifts from 15 degree north to 20 degree north during break ISM phase? That is northward shift of LLG. Uh, yeah. yeah. Like, like uh, as you see in the intrusion, uh, in, the, in the intrusion composite in the figure. So here actually what is just is is the is the shift uh, of the of the low monsoon low low, low level jet from 20, uh, like uh, its its core is located between 20 to 30 degree north while in the case of the no intrusion uh, its core is located between a 10 20 20 degree north and also like if as you see in the intrusion part actually uh, it, there is a broadening and the weakening of the monsoon low level jet during the intrusion period okay is there any other question if not, uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, Damodar Bagale on the spatial and temporal variability of monsoon rainfall and its trends on the southern slopes of central Himalayas. So Damodar, you have maximum of 14 minutes. Please try to limit your talk within that. Yeah, please start okay. sharing the screen. I'm trying to share. Yeah, if you have an issue, uh, have, uh, we can share it from our end. Uh, that we can share. Yeah, we can see the screen. You just make it uh, full screen. Is it yeah, okay? Fine. Yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Mm -hmm. Namaste to all, respected chair of the 7th WMO International Workshop on Monsoons, respected session chair, invited experts, experts and all participants from different regions of the world. I am Ramadar Bagale, PhD student from Trivandrum University, Kathmandu, Nepal. I am going to present my uh, initial uh, results uh, of entitled spatial and temporal variability of monsoon rainfall and its trends on the southern slopes of central Himalayas. Introduction, the Asian monsoon circulation system of the annual cycle has been well developed. It has been developed, uh, divided into two different uh, wet and dry phases, which undergoes a periodic and high amplitude, uh, amplitude variation on inter-seasonal, annual and interannual time scale. Uh, the active and break periods of monsoon is characterized by maxima and minima duration of precipitation over South Asia. Uh, monsoon is is the lifeline of South Asian people. The annual cycle of monsoon system on, on southern slopes of, uh, slopes of central Himalaya found to be well developed. Uh, most of the rainfall system is generally recorded to September from um, the Southwest Indian monsoon. Summer time is dominated by monsoonal climate, while winter time by weather uh, disturbances. Generally, monsoon rainfall is higher in the central and eastern region uh, then comparing to the western region of Nepal. In this investigation, large monsoon descent and excess years associated with the accordance to Illino and Lanino years during the last 42 years, 1977 to 2018, the comparative large monsoon descent and excess years rainfall variability was found in the various, uh, various parts of Nepal. 
study area nepal is landlock landlock countries lies between in india and china india and china in this uh, study we have used uh, uh, 107 uh, meat stations uh, meat stations um, which are spread all over the country uh, data uh, data and method data daily precipitation data obtained from department of hydrology and metrology uh, uh, metrology government of nepal uh, monthly sy data um, 1977 to 2008 obtained from NOAA, um, uh, daily precipitation data, uh, we feel missing uh, data by normal ratio method, reliability of the time series data checked by uh, using robust statistical tools, uh, investigation, man, uh, man, um, investigation trend analysis by man candle, um, uh, anomalies um, uh, are investigated national wise and uh, regional wise, comparison between temporal and spectral variability of rainfalls. Uh, we have uh, analyzed um, Nepal summer monsoon rainfall, uh, rainfall and uh, southern oscillation index results. Um, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, chapter, we have uh, analyzed uh, spectral and temporal variability of monsoon rainfalls uh, in 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 monsoon uh, most um, in nepal most of the monsoon rainfall are recorded from june to uh, june to september uh, uh, around 80% monsoon rainfall uh, rainfall in september uh, near uh, big 20, near 27% uh, in uh, in winter december january february uh, 3% rainfall uh, pre monsoon 14% uh, March, April, May, post monsoon 4%, this October and November. Year to year variability of monsoon are shown in figure. Uh, in figure, um, uh, in monsoon season, uh, the variability, uh, there is large variability, 72% uh, in 1992 and 86% uh, in 1988. Monsoon anomalies. We have used 100, uh, 107 rainfall stations, monthly rainfall stations, for uh, to study the anom anomalies. Uh, in this uh, in this figure, uh, there is large uh, there is large temporal variability of monsoon uh, in 19% uh, axis in 19, uh, 1984 and 19% uh, nearly 19% below in 1992. There are uh, seven, there are seven uh, axis and seven uh, deficit uh, monsoon rainfalls during the 42 uh, years. Now, uh, in regional wise, this uh, in in regional wise, uh, western, central, and eastern Nepal, uh, we have uh, used uh, 28 stations for the western Nepal, uh, 32 stations for eastern Nepal, and 47 stations for um, central Nepal. Uh, in this, uh, uh, from this analysis, we uh, we found that central Nepal records the more rainfall than the eastern and western Nepal. In regional wise anomaly in uh, western Nepal in 1979, 45% uh, below the normal rainfall, and in central Nepal in 1992 around 30%, and in eastern Nepal in 1982 around 25%. Mean monsoon rainfall. There are large uh, spectral variability of mean monsoon rainfall uh, in Nepal. Um, especially central Nepal records uh, recorded more rainfalls than than the uh, eastern and western parts of Nepal. Uh, uh, this is uh, Lumle Station. Uh, this records um, highest rainfall in Nepal. And uh, in near uh, Mustang uh, region, uh, only 10 kilometer far from here records the lowest uh, rainfall. Uh, below 200 uh, millimeter. So in central Nepal, there are large spectral variability of rainfall. There are other packets in northeast Nepal, uh, Gumthang and uh, Noom region. In generally, uh, western region uh, records lower rainfall than eastern and uh, central regions of Nepal. Monsoon rainfall tends. 
generally uh, monsoon rainfalls are decreasing uh, in in nepal uh, in annual wise 0, uh, 0.9 mm per monsoons uh, generally western western region uh, have low monsoon but it has low decreasing trend and eastern nepal uh, decreasing more than other regions we have la we have large deep sand monsoon rainfall um, in monsoon rainfall 1977 and 19, uh, 1992 and 2015, it has uh, la uh, covers large uh, areas, more than 70% below uh, normal uh, monsoon rainfall in Nepal. Uh, in Nepal, there are different monsoon dynamics in different years. Um, um, though uh, central and eastern Nepal records the more rainfall than uh, western and northwest region records uh, uh, least rainfall in Nepal. Large axis monsoon rainfalls. In large uh, axis monsoon rainfalls, uh, 1984 and 1988, uh, it has two high uh, rank uh, axis rainfall in Nepal. Uh, in these uh, axis uh, rainfalls, uh, central and eastern regions records more rainfall, uh, especially in July, this central Nepal uh, uh, has high vulnerability from fraud events. There is high uh, large spatial variability in axis rainfall, but in uh, in central Nepal, uh, Mustang region low below two, 200 millimeter per monsoon, and in Lumli near Pokhara region recorded more than 5,000 millimeter um, per monsoon. There is large spatial variability, which are clearly shown in this figure. Large composite uh, distribution of com composite diffusion monsoon rainfall. In this uh, analysis, we have taken five years, uh, which has below 10% um, uh, anom uh, anomaly, uh, and, and we have average, and then interpret it shows uh, even in deficient uh, rainfalls, uh, Central Nepal and uh, Northeast Nepal got the, uh, got, got the higher rainfalls than other uh, regions. Uh, in excess rainfalls, uh, we, ha we have taken three years, uh, which are um, above 15% anomaly, um, then average and inter interpreted. It shows that Central Nepal and Eastern Nepal uh, records more rainfall than Western Nepal. The uh, relation between some uh, Nepal summer monsoon and uh, southern oscillation index. In this uh, in this 42 years analysis, uh, around 74% uh, anomaly and uh, yes, I have a phase relation when anomaly when southern uh, yes, I increase. Uh, Nepal rainfall monsoon increase when SY decrease, uh, Nepal's uh, monsoon rainfall decrease. Uh, uh, generally, in fraud and drought events, uh, the uh, SY and the uh, Nepal summer monsoons uh, are in phase re relation than the general years. Conclusions. Out of seven large deficient monsoon drought years, only three drought years associated with El Nino episodes, 1992, 2009, and 2015, and four drought years, 1977, 79, 2005, and 2006, are recorded in non-Illinois years. Similarly, seven large excess monsoon floods years, three flood years, 1990, 2002, and three mm, associated with the La Lalina years. In the regional perspective, there was diverse monsoon dynamics over the central and eastern regions of Nepal lies on the southern slopes of the central Himalayas. The central region of Nepal recorded more rainfall during the monsoon season than the eastern and western regions. The region was more vulnerable than any other regions. The central region has recorded large spectral variability of summer rainfall ranging from less than 200 millimeter per month in lesser Himalayas to more than uh, 3,500 millimeters uh, per month in mid mountains. There, there was a strong correlation between 
the Nepal summer monsoon rainfall in MR and the southern oscillation index, generally large negative positive magnitude of SY on Indian and Pacific Ocean influence, weakening and strengthening Nepal summer monsoon rainfall. Thank you. Thank you, Damodar, for maintaining the time. Thank you, ma'am. So, ma yeah. Uh, so, give opportunity. Yeah. So, any questions uh, to the speaker? I don't see anything on the chat. Okay. If there are no questions, uh, let's thank uh, Damodar and move to the last speaker. Thank you. Uh, Donaldi Sukma. Termina, on the evaluation of multiple gridded precipitation data sets using coach observations uh, over Indonesia, Indonesia wow. during Asian Australian monsoon period. Yeah. Damodar, please uh, mute yourself. Dr. Donaldi. Dr. Donaldi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can. Please uh, share your screen. OK. Okay, can you see my slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon, and everyone, wherever you are. Can you be a bit uh, more louder? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, today I'm going to talk about the, the evaluation of uh, multiple aggregate uh, precipitation data set uh, using uh, gauge observation over Indonesia during the Asian Australian monsoon uh, period. And for this study, uh, I work with my uh, college uh, in uh, BMKG, the Indonesian Agency for uh, Meteorology, Climatology, and Geophysics. And <clears throat> so for the background of this, uh, uh, this study that uh, we have a uh, rain gauge that is usually used for manual measurement. Uh, of precipitation directly on at the surface at the point scale and Indonesia especially uh, the number of the meteorology station is still limited and sparsely uh, distributed especially over the mountainous and some inaccessible remote areas that are likely that likely not available and the application of the gridded precipitation that I said can cope this uh, lack of rain gauge observation and also it can uh, be used to uh, use for daily missing values problems in the observation uh, time series. And so we know that there are several categories of gridded precipitation data set, uh, uh, which is that one is uh, based on the rain gauge and then satellite base uh, sometimes is uh, <clears throat> mixed between the gauge, soundings and satellite base. And we also know there is uh, the, the analysis data sets. So uh, there is several studies that uh, compares uh, the gridded precipitation, but some of them are uh, partially and uh, maybe just uh, up to 10 at the, the one that I know. Uh, that this study is uh, used uh, at, at least 13, six existing uh, gridded precipitations products over Indonesia. And then we do the direct comparison with the rain gauge measurement at various time scale. Uh, the data is from 2001 to 2012, so it's about 12 years. And especially we are looking at the, the DGF and the GGR where the Australian and Asian monsoon period are uh, strong. So this is the monsoon that has been talking uh, in this uh, today, and we are focusing on the Asian Australian monsoon region, as we see that uh, uh, 
like the Indonesia and usually the the southern part of Indonesia is affected by the Australian uh, monsoon here over the Java Island uh, and then over the year actually the the rainfall is just moving up and north uh, north and south uh, like during the uh, uh, December January February that uh, the, Asia, the Australian monsoon are strong, so we have more rainfall over the southern part. And during the June, July, August, the rainfall are moving north, and most of the Indonesian part at the north part of the northern part have a, a more rainfall. And previous study also shown that uh, we have at least uh, three distinct uh, rainfall uh, region, climate region. Uh, like if we see on the top left, uh, there is a region A, a B, and C that uh, each region has uh, a typical, uh, the different, distinct typical of uh, seasonal uh, rainfall. Like uh, in the region A, we have like a, a, a rainfall peak over the December, January, February. And like region B, uh, it has uh, two peaks like over in March and in October and in Region C we have a area that have a peak over June, July, August just the opposite of the Region A <clears throat> and if we uh, use the, the area uh, we see that the southern part has a blue region uh, it has a Region A type and then the yellow one in the northwest uh, part, the northwest region, and the red uh, station is on the uh, northeast uh, region. <clears throat> so for this study, we use uh, 82 station data precipitation uh, for 12 years, and we use reference from the Supari et al. papers in 2017, and uh, we also use uh, 13 credit precipitation data set as shown in the on the left uh, slide <clears throat> and uh, for the simplicity that we divided the Indonesian region into three area uh, based on the the seasonal pattern that I've shown in the previous slide so basically we have a northwest uh, region with the 24 uh, station northeast region with the 12 stations and the southern uh, region with the 45 uh, stations. And we use the, the matrix to calculate. Uh, first is the coefficient correlation, uh, the root mean square error and the bias in percent. So basically we multiply by 100. And we use the point to grid comparison using the nearest neighborhood method in this site, in this study. So this is the summary of the statistical measures that we get. So we see on the top, on the left side is the daily uh, comparison for the coefficient correlation, RMSE and error. And on the, on the right side is the monthly one. So we see that uh, on the table as well that uh, on daily time scale, uh, the CPC uh, data set and the MERA uh, data set are uh, outperformed the other data set. But uh, this this data set is tend to be underestimate the uh, the rain gauge data and followed by the GPCC. Uh, but for the the monthly and yearly time scale, that CPC was found to be the best performing data set, uh, followed by the MERA2, uh, GPM, GPCC, and, and TRAM. And, and while the GRA55 are registered to be the, the worst performance at all time scales, followed by the, the ERA in TRAM uh, data. <clears throat> so uh, I, I just forgot to mention before that these three, uh, uh, the 13 data set are, uh, three of them are compared from the, the rain gauge base, we know that CPC, GPCC, and GPCP are based on the rain gauge observation, and maybe there is do some interpolation algorithm. But the 
the Seymour Persian uh, Cherif GS map, GS map uh, tram and GPM is uh, mostly are the satellite base based and uh, GRA 55 uh, era in trim era 5 and Vera 2 are uh, actually the the reanalysis uh, data <clears throat> and uh, if we look at the seasonal values of each uh, data set and then we put it on the on the plot and we see that uh, in general that during the the june july august uh, and uh, september october november uh, the correlation are greater than during the december january february and uh, march april may uh, both at uh, daily and and monthly time scale uh, and and we see that in this in this plot and if we do the order of the seasonal rmse from the uh, lowest to the highest is uh, the first one is the gga uh, son uh, mam and and last one is the dgf so so dga is the the lowest uh, rmse here and if we look this more detail into the uh, tables uh, we see this here and as uh, previous one that we saw that the cpc are the best uh, uh, data set followed by uh, mera 2 and if we look more detail is followed by the uh, gs map and tram at the bottom part uh, i'll give you also the the bias so we can see the uh, there is some uh, data set has uh, overestimate the the rain gauge data but some of them are also underestimate uh, and then next uh, we try to look at the different regions the based on the one that i uh, reset uh, at the first one and this is for all months so this base this this figures is basically similar i just put it to and i just want to make comparison with the next slide later but from this uh, figures we see that and the best performance was were found in the southern region so this is here in the uh, green area uh, for all gridded data set uh, but over the s region it's uh, underestimated the, the rain gauge data uh, except for uh, cpc uh, cmorph and uh, gs map and the mera 2 as well uh, and we see that the worst uh, performance were identified in the northeast uh, region which is the yellow uh, colored region uh, colored bar in this in these figures and this is for all months i mean from december to uh, from january to december and if we do compare with the seasonal uh, uh, period this is for the dgf when the austrian summer monsoon was stronger and the mmm mam and <clears throat> we see that uh, during dgf the performance was best were found in the northwest region and the lowest uh, correlation were found on on the northeast region uh, while the highest nmsa were found in the south uh, region and and during the mam uh, more performance of the data set were consistent for all regions and and the bias on the dgf uh, were better on were better than the mam especially in the southern and the northern northwestern uh, regions so we can see here that uh, the error is a bit uh, less compared to the the mmm and for the gga uh, and the son we saw it in this uh, plot uh, and we see that uh, during the gga and september october november the the best performances uh, in this case is the the one has a lowest rmse if we see here uh, is the what were found over the uh, southern region because we know that uh, over the june july august southern region uh, experienced the dry condition so that's why probably the, uh, we have a low uh, rmsa during this this period and the worst one was identified in the northwest uh, region because during this this uh, this period that the northwest experienced the 
uh, the rainfall, the heavy rainfall. And uh, during the GGA and the SON, most data set were overestimating. <clears throat> so we see on the bottom uh, graph, of especially the, the southern region, the one has a green uh, color. Most of them are overestimating the, the rain gauge data. And I think the, for the summary of this uh, presentation that we reported the 13 grid precipitation data set performances over Indonesia uh, with uh, daily and monthly time scales and also the for the 12 years period. So on daily time scale, CPC and Mera 2 are found to be the, uh, the best performance, but tend to be underestimated. Uh, on monthly and yearly time scale, uh, CPC was found to be the best, uh, followed by uh, Mera 2, GPM, uh, GPCC, uh, and GRA is the is the worst, followed by the ERA entry. And the performance of data set were better during the June, July, August, and uh, September, October, November than during uh, DGF and MAM. And if we look at the regions, the best performance were found in in uh, S region, and the worst is over the Northeast region for all months and data set. And if we look at specific uh, season, uh, during the DGF, uh, the best performance were found in the Northwest region, while during the June, July, August, and September, October, November, were found in the S and the southern region. So most of data sets were overestimating the rain gauge data, except for the SPC, uh, CMOB, GS map, and uh, uh, Mera 2. I think that's all for my talk. Uh, so thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Donaldi. <clears throat> so now we have uh, any questions to the speaker? I don't see any thing in the chat. So if there are no questions, uh, let's thank all the speakers. So we had actually a wide variety of uh, topics under this theme. So we had uh, linking Arctic Oscillation and Atlantic SSTs with the Northeast ISMR, then uh, analyzing the changes in the TC activity over the South China Sea and West Pacific, then examination of the dry air intrusion during the break spells of Indian summer monsoon, then uh, the ISMR trends over the southern slopes of central Himalayas, ne Nepal, and uh, finally to the comparison of different uh, graded data sets uh, on different time scales with the rain gauge observations in Indonesia. So. I thank all the speakers uh, for giving the nice talks. And uh, now I hand over to the organizers for concluding it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Suspita Joseph, for nicely conducting the session. Yes, we had very good uh, hype talks and uh, yeah, there was discussion also. And most scientists must have enjoyed it. And this video will be available. Uh, if anybody had not, could not see it or watch it live, they can also see later. So with this, uh, we just uh, conclude this uh, parallel session in Hall A. And uh, now we will come back again after 15 minutes, about 11.45 local IST, and that is 6.15 UTC for the short oral presentation. Till that time, bye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, so people have joined. Dr. Rajiv, are you there? Yes, yes, I am here. Can we start? Yeah, yeah let us start then. Uh, OK, so, so let us uh, now uh, our second day short oral session, but it is the fourth day. So Dr. Rajiv Chattopadhyay, uh, who will be coordinating the session, in fact, and uh, already our uh, the local team have already given the inputs, how many people will be presenting. So from their side, they will not do. So over to you, Rajiv, now you just start the proceeding. Okay, so good morning. So let us start uh, without uh, further delay. I guess there are there is a slight rearrangement here uh, in terms of uh, the presentation as which was provided in the website list. So. First is, uh, let us start without further delay. First is uh, M. Sharma. Yes. Yeah, please. Rajiv, how many are there? You have got the information? Total, how many there are there? There are 16. There are 16. Shall I share once again in the screen who are the order? Yeah, that you can do, yeah, I think. So, but it is already shared, so. Uh, go ahead. So you, that 16 minutes, they can get one minute extra also. Extra, one minute extra, yeah. So right. approximately three, three and a half minute, approximately. Shall I start, sir? Yeah, please start. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, myself, Monica Sharma from India Meteorological Department. I'll be presenting before you the characteristics of monsoon disturbances over the North Indian Ocean. And we have analyzed the uh, data during the period 1991 to 22. And we have studied the trends in terms of the genesis frequency, life period, track and translational speed, accumulated cyclone energy, and power dissipation index of the series. Next, please. Uh, if you consider the genesis frequency, there is significant decreasing trend in the frequency of CDs developing over the Bay of, Bay of Bengal during the monsoon season, uh, June to September. And you can see that there is about 57% decrease over, over Bay of Bengal. On an average, about 2.9 CDs uh, uh, develop per year uh, over Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea during 1991 to 2020 against... 1990. If we consider the translational speed, no significant trend in 12-hour uh, average translational speed is seen over both the basins. Considering the life period, there is an increasing trend in the life period of CDs over the Arabian Sea with decreasing trend over Bay of Bengal. This is mainly because of limited uh, pro westward propagation over the Bay of Bengal. If you see over the Arabian Sea, no such significant trend is seen. But over the Arabian Sea, if you see uh, the frequency of the, uh, the red bars, they indicate the frequency of the CDs propagating, uh, reaching up to 75 degrees. So it has uh, decreased significantly during these years. We consider the accumulated cyclone energy and power dissipation index over the Arabian Sea. There is a significant increasing trend over the AS. It is mainly attributed to increase in the genesis frequency over uh, of CDs over Arabian Sea during these years, increase in life period. 
and hence increase in the ACE and TDI over AS. But if we consider Bay of Bengal, then there is a decreasing trend in the life period and also westward propagation of the CDs and hence the ACE and PDI over the Bay of Bengal, uh, a decreasing trend has been seen. So that's all from my side. Thank you. So any quick question? Yes. So thank you. Thank uh, you, sir. Uh, next is uh, Ashu. Please start. Okay. Am I audible now? Yeah, li little louder, please. Okay, is it fine? Yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, yes. Good morning to all of you. My name is Ashu Mamgen and I'm from NCMRWF working as a scientist. Uh, this short presentation is based on global and regional uh, ensemble prediction system. Both are running operationally in NCMRWF. The regional model is running at convection permitting scale that is at 4 kilometer grid resolution and uh, global model is at 12 kilometer resolution. So we all know that uh, there is always a requirement of location time specific weather details by the forecasters and end users. The uncertainty that occur in the limited area forecast on both the temporal and spatial scale uh, can be represented by the EPS at the regional scale. So this type of the study is basically to guide uh, the end user in decision making while providing a forecast of any weather event. It is not about uh, judging any model that uh, which one is the better one. Uh, that is also not fair to say. But how to make use of small pieces of information from the forecast products from these models can uh, help. So uh, in this limited time frame, I'm showing uh, only few results, a uh, uh, few ma ma uh, verification matrices for uh, precipitation uh, only. So uh, we can see uh, for first uh, the table where uh, the both the model configuration has been shown. And uh, this period of study is uh, for two months, August and September 2019. So the results are based on 11 member at 00 UTC from both the global and regional APSs. For the comparison purpose, I uh, consider only 11 member from the uh, global ensemble. So of course, the member of uh, number of member uh, of uh, ensemble are uh, very less as compared to the uh, spread in the forecast is concerned. In the first figure, you can see uh, that uh, NEPS R, where R is R stand for the regional and uh, in NEPS GG stand for the global one. You can see that NEPS in NEPS R, the precipitation spread is quite higher uh, as compared to the global one. So uh, NEPS R, uh, this is the positive side uh, we have seen. So, but uh, only uh, uh, looking into this figure doesn't mean that our uh, observation is a part of the ensemble member. Uh, I have done also the another uh, um, verification uh, matrix that is the rank histogram. Uh, it is also uh, it also it is not shown here, but that also indicated that uh, the the spread or the uh, distribution is more uniform in uh, NEPSR as compared to NEPSG. So another figure is the reliability diagram. It is basically gives the measure of consistency of the forecasting system. So it is uh, conditioned on the forecast, given a forecast probability, the value of the relative observed frequency of the event is measured. So uh, we can see the under forecasting for low probability and over forecasting for high probability in both the models. So uh, this indicates over, uh, overconfident or under dispersive forecasting uh, for higher probability. But if we see that in an EPSG, in the global model, uh, the low probability probability forecast uh, as compared to the NEPSR has more confidence in NEPSG. But for the higher probability forecast, NEPSR is doing better. Uh, another figure in uh, figure three, we, we see uh, the area under the curve that is uh, measured from the relative operating characteristic ROC. So that uh, value of the area under the curve is given. So in, uh, in another uh, figure, in figure B, from figure uh, 3B, the another one is the uh, ASS, which is the area skill score. So it is also, it is the skill score uh, calculated from the ROC area under the curve. So in both the cases, we can see that uh, the discrimination property in the global model is better than the regional model. 
another uh, another in the c part of the figure uh, 3 the rps uh, rps value which is uh, the rank probability score so basically uh, this is to evaluate probability forecast for multiple categories so uh, here i have considered the different categories from the imd definition so rps method rewards the sharp forecast and emphasizes accuracy by penalizing the large errors compared to the near uh, near miss forecast so this uh, verification Ashok, technique please, is basically yes for your finalized yeah sir uh, this is the last figure only so uh, this is uh, basically uh, made for the uh, verification of the rainfall this metric so here we can see the uh, regional model is doing uh, better than the global model so our uh, conclusion is uh, our three points if i made then they improve the precipitation spread in case of NEPSR and for a low, prob uh, low uh, precipitation probability, NEPSG is slightly better as compared to NEPSR and for higher precipitation probability, NEPSR is better. The NEPSR has the better rank uh, probability score. It means that the discrimination property is, uh, score, uh, where, whereas the discrimination property is better in case of NEPSG. So this is from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, uh, since uh, le let's move to the next speaker, uh, Paromita Chakravarti. Paromita, if you are Are you there, Paramita? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes. Okay. Please, please go ahead. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today, uh, my presentation is on extreme rainfall events prediction during Indian summer monsoon using the convective uh, scale ensemble prediction system at Pensema WF. And uh, here, uh, basically, we have uh, made an effort to tackle the uncertainty at shorter time scales, like uh, uh, from day one to day three uh, on the regional scale or the convective uh, with a convective scale resolution EPS. And uh, uh, we have used the NEPS, that is the uh, regional scale uh, EPS at NCMA WF to study uh, extremely heavy and very heavy rainfall events, uh, which is uh, greater than 200 millimeter per day, and very heavy is uh, 120 to 200 millimeter per day as defined by IMD's uh, classification or terminology. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. So the uh, configuration of the uh, regional NEPS is uh, the number of ensemble members used are controlled plus 11 members uh, and uh, the driving model from which we are providing the initial conditions and the boundary conditions is the global NEPS that is uh, at resolution of uh, 12 kilometers and the domain is shown here in the uh, input box and we are using the science configuration for this study is proto regional atmosphere 1T and uh, at, uh, we are providing the LVC, LVCs at a frequency of 3 hours and the forecast length is of uh, 75 hours and the model time scale is 60 seconds and since the uh, model resolution is quite high so here we are using the explicit conviction uh, and no other parameterization schemes and the uh, initial condition um, perturbations are provided by the ETKF ensemble transform carbon filter and the uh, Model uncertainties are taken care by the random parameter scheme. So here I have considered uh, uh, an extremely heavy rainfall event that occurred on 4th of August uh, 2019 near Maharashtra coast. As can be seen from the observed uh, rainfall picture here, uh, this is basically the NCMRWF satellite page merged rainfall. Uh, and here we can see that uh, quite heavy rainfall and extremely heavy rainfall could be observed near uh, Maharashtra coast on this day which could be uh, quite uh, well captured and resemblance was better in NEPSR as compared to NEPSG in terms of extremely heavy rainfall prediction. And uh, the probabilities were also better predicted in NEPSR as compared to uh, NEPSG. Uh, so here we can see that NEPSR could predict very heavy rainfall precipitation uh, with uh, more than 90% probability. 
and extremely heavy precipitation to be uh, predicted with 70% probability and 90% uh, over some of the isolated areas. Whereas NPSG, that is the global model, uh, was unable to predict the extremely heavy precipitation and uh, the probability were quite low uh, for the uh, very heavy precipitation. And uh, we also performed, uh, conducted the verification over two months, July and August, and we could see that the overall uh, prediction speed of the NPSR uh, regional model was better uh, as compared to the uh, global model in shorter time scales. Uh, that, that is like day one to uh, between day three. So with that, I would uh, conclude my talk. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Uh, so, if there is question once a quick question. If there is not, then let us move to the next one. Thank you, Paramitra. Yeah, uh, thank you. Prabhat. Hello. Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Prabhadaj Group. Today, I am here to present my MTech dissertation work on the topic simulation of a cloud-based event over Kerala during 2019 monsoon season, done under the guidance of Dr. Ablashes. Uh, the main objective of our work is to simulate the cloud-based using WRF model to verify the physical, microphysical and convective parameterization, which will lead to a reasonably good forecast of the extreme rainfall. It is important to investigate the role of dynamics and microphysics convection, etc., in the cloudburst event that occurred in the Kerala 2019 Kerala, in order to forecast such events with an adequate lead time. The use of multi-satellite sensors makes it uh, possible to investigate the model performance and its evaluation through a process-based approach. Uh, to study the performance of cumulus parameterization, sir, previous slides arrived. To study the performance of cumulus, uh, para cumulus and microphysics parameterization, we ran simulation in the combinations of uh, cumulus and microphysics parameterization with all other parameterization schemes constant. That is YSU for PBL, RRTMG for uh, long wave and short wave radiation, unified NOVA scheme for land surface, etc. So we ran WRF uh, model for a nested domain with a 9 and 3 kilometer resolution. And coming to the results, the first figure shows the bias of different meteorological variables in percentage the all values are area averaged over the Kerala region. We can see that most, almost all the uh, simulations are uh, predicting uh, temperature at 2 meter with very less bias. But the variables like uh, tropospheric temperature, zonal wind shear, soil moisture, and uh, zonal wind at 200 HPA are all, all, all underestimating. And from the figure, uh, we can see that the simulations are underestimating the zonal, zonal wind at H50 HPA, uh, uh, accumulated rainfall, vertically integrated moisture flux, etc. And from the figure, we can see that the simulation using new TDK are uh, in the cumulus, par uh, cumulus parameter schemes are showing very less uh, bias compared to other simulations. And among the new, TD, uh, new TDK simulation, uh, new TDK simulation with uh, Ferrier in the microphysics combination shows uh, best results. After comparing with the spatial distribution of rainfall, a new TDK Ferrier shows the best results. And coming to the cloud hydrometeorological vertical profile, we can see that uh, the simulation using TDK schemes uh, capture better hydrometeorological profile than uh, new TDK, which shows better in the other, other variables. And then comparing between the new TDK, new TDK got that shows the best result in capturing the cloud hydrometeorologics. So from overall, uh, we can see that new TDK Ferrier shows a better performance in simulating the cloud burst among these uh, co combinations. But not a single parameterization scheme can capture both rainfall and cloud like that everything. So we need more a better parameterization scheme to capture all the phenomena and dynamics of the cloudburst event. Uh, thank you. This is from my side. Thank you, Prabhat. 
if there is any quick question Robert, what is your uh, reanalysis? I mean, you have verified with respect to what? Uh, IMD. Uh, IMD. Wind, wind and others, era 5 data and rainfall with uh, GPM. Sorry, GPM. Okay. Precipitation data. Okay, thank you. So, if there are no more questions, let's move to the next speaker. A. Madhulata. Am yeah, I audible? Hello? Yeah. 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 Can you see me? Okay. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving this opportunity to present the work. I am Madhula Thakisetty from IMD New Delhi. Today, I am going to discuss about the importance of thermodynamic indices and background forcing response for severe convection over Indian region different different seasons. Basically, uh, accurate forecasting of the severe system is so complex because it requires the knowledge of uh, nonlinear interaction between the local thermodynamics and also the synoptic conditions. As you are aware, the thermodynamic evolution is directly proportional to the convective evolution. It is very it necessary and important to study this vertical evolution of the system using thermodynamic indices and the basic motto is to investigate the monthly thresholds of uh, various indices uh, in different season which can be helpful proxy to operationally forecast the systems over indian region next slide please yeah uh, if you see this uh, coming to the data, we have used 30 years of IMD monthly normals radio sonde uh, network data to see the local thermodynamics and to understand the background thermodynamics for the same period, era for reanalysis data is used and uh, the lightning hotspots are identified using the uh, TRMM list data and coming to the methodology, all these 29 indices are calculated based on NCL inbuilt function. However, the Cape computation is very much important and the construction of moist area wet is basically based on the uh, construction of uh, conservation of moist static energy. Uh, all these indices include single level energy parameters and dynamic parameters. If you see the first figure, this is I'm showing here as a season wise pre monsoon. If you see the lightning activity, it's all over India. It is there, but major uh, lightning activity is happening over northeast India. Uh, if you see the background synoptic forcing responsible for this, if you see the second figure from the era five data, you can see heat lower over central India. There is one high uh, over north central Bay of Bengal. This high results in moisture intrusion from Bay of Bengal to the northeast Indian region. And also in a similar way, if you see the wind speed 10 meters, there is wind discontin uh, wind convergence over there in this region. And if you see the low level winds at the 8 hectopascal, you can see at uh, there are southwestern moisture intrusion is there and in the mid level the colder intrusion is there which which create unstable atmosphere and upper level divergence is there all factors are supporting for high intense activity over this region coming to south india because of wind discontinuity over this region the thunderstorm activity is happening and in the northwestern it is mostly due to the convective out type or pressure gradient type and uh, coming to the uh, monsoon season if you see uh, uh, the lightning activity is more over this uh, northwest india since there is still heat low over rajasthan and it is basically pressure gradient type and, and if you see the rest of the country in the monsoon season you can see strong winds over the surface so the, even the moisture is the temperature will decrease so there is not much vertical development and also vertical wind shear is there more so uh, there are more or less in the systems you can see but in the post monsoon also even the wind uh, here it is very less intense if you see the uh, lightning activity it is there but it is less intense uh, basically this is due to the less moisture and less temperatures so in a nutshell if you see the in the pre monsoon it is due to high insulation humidity high uh, instability and the moderate wind shear are responsible for the vertical development but in the monsoon it is uh, 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 these conditions are not there uh, high wind shear high moisture and low temperatures but in the post monsoon the temperature uh, is less the basic mechanism is clearly evident from background synoptic forcing explains the basic mechanism and if you're coming to the local forcing these are the 35 stations we have considered uh, i am showing here three T5 diagrams which are corresponding to three lightning spots for the different season. For the first one, if you see, this is for the northeast India. And this is, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, if you see this, there are different in variations in the thermodynamic indices season wise. 
So we try to see the correlation of lightning and uh, uh, the indices for the different regions. You can see this uh, rectangles. You can see the correlation is positive for this uh, precipitable water and also the K. I am showing only two parameters. I we want to verify it. You can see the diurnal variation of this indices for seasonal wise. Uh, we took one case study that is 19th March. If you see the index uh, threshold for K is around. Uh, um, if you see the observed uh, for the case study, it is more than the threshold in case of PPW also, it is more than 40 mm. So if you investigate these things uh, operationally, you can give the forecast of the severe convective system for season wise. And uh, this is very and mean from the uh, bias from the mean can be helpful for both from observations and uh, the model. Uh, these uh, indices are going to be operational used for operational for forecast. So they are putting it in thunderstorm branches. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. For more information, visit our video. Thanks. Uh, so in the interest of time, let's move to the next speaker. Good afternoon, Hello. sir. Am I audible? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present a short oral talk on uh, impact-based forecast of flash over South Asia. Uh, uh, this is presented by me, Himlika from IMD. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, presentation is about a recent services started by IMD, that is South Asia Flash Flood Guidance System, which is in collaboration with WMO, HRC, and USAID implement. Uh, in October 2020, serving five countries, that is Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, wherein WMO recognized IMD as regional center. Basically, this system is a robust system designed to provide real-time necessary products to support the development of warnings for flash floods from rainfall events through the use of remote sense precipitation, that is radar and satellite, ground observations, and hydrological models. Uh, this flash flood that is available approximately one at uh, one lakh small watersheds delineated to 30 meter dim. Also, the hydrological model used in this is stack SMS, that is psychromental model. The daily inputs which are uh, used in this model are daily observed rainfall data for about 5,000 stations, 17 radar precipitation data currently, and more are being ingested. NWP model that is WR3 kilometer and COM4 and GFS12. And then we have uh, satellite precipitation data that is from NOAA in the form of two products that is global hydroestimator and microwave global hydroestimator and the model which I mentioned. So the main output of this system uh, are in two that is for short term that is for next three hours, six hours is the flash flood threat and for next 12, 12, 24 and 36 hours is the flash flood risk which is, which is based on the NWP model. So these two products are given daily starting from 1st May of the season, rainfall season, uh, four times a day for uh, the in, in the form of guidance. Next slide, please. Uh, as uh, I, here an overall picture I want to show is from general forecasting, IMD, uh, which is giving heavy rainfall warning, we have moved to risk, which is 12 to 24 hours and 36 hours product. And it has further be localized and uh, given an approximate for and six hours duration that is the flash flood threat. So this way IMD has moved from general forecasting to the flash flood threat, particularly localized area uh, for six hours of forecast. Uh, we have uh, in the past three years uh, because of the lack of time, but there are many case studies where uh, the system has successfully given the impact uh, based forecast. Uh, and these bulletins are issued regularly to the stakeholders through emails, WhatsApp, and other social media platforms uh, to in India to the various government agencies, South Asia, that is uh, in, to the National Meteorological Hydrological Services of various South Asian countries, and also to the World Bank for their further analysis. So this was short, in short about the South Asia platform guidance system. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So I think the presentation is just. So is that if there is question. Let us move to the next. The contents are not visible at me.
Visible now? Sir? No. It is showing I am admin IMD sharing starting to share content. Right. Yes, sir, uh, here we could see other pieces also showing the slides. Can other it anybody is showing? So all uh, it is actually visible uh, a little bit of uh, time maybe required. Yeah, yeah. Now it is it has come. Yeah, so next speaker is uh, KSS Sai Sujan. Please start. Uh, hello, am I audible? Hello? Yes. Okay. Monsoon low pressure systems in couple models. So monsoon low pressure systems are uh, synoptic skull cyclonic vortices embedded in the large Indian summer monsoon circulation. The objective of this paper is to propose an automated algorithm to classify the LP's genesis over Bay of Bengal broadly into in situ, which are due to the local processes and downstream amplification in which the westward propagating atmospheric disturbance from the Pacific amplify over Bay of Bengal. Despite its importance to the water security of the country, the fundamental genesis of mechanisms of LPS are not fully understood. In addition, although the current, gen current generation of general circulation models simulate LPS, but they have relatively low skill in capturing LPS activity. Furthermore, LPS uh, in situ and uh, downstream LPS genesis are not quantified in the couple models yet. So, using this algorithm, we tracked the LPS activity in 11 CMFA models. Uh, from the uh, yeah, next slide, please, sir. So we used daily uh, mean sea level pressure, relative vorticity and winds at 850 hectopascals and potential vorticity and temperature at 500 hectopascals from the RI uh, renal data set and 11 CMFI models. So LPS activity in the models are uh, tracked using the algorithm developed by the Praveen et al, so which is basically a uh, sea level pressure uh, tracking algorithm. The LPS are broadly classified into in situ and downstream based on the propagation, propagation of uh, relative vorticity anomaly from yeah. the Pacific by defining a criteria and thresholds. This algorithm is an automation of manual classification. Hello? Hello? Next week. Uh, so, uh, this algorithm is an automation of manual classification done by Mira et al. But with a slight modification of defining an additional category named uncertain events. The uncertain events are LPS genesis where both the in situ and downstream LPS genesis mechanisms are present. Panel A and B in the figure one shows the track density and propagation vectors of LPS, and C and D shows the uh, strom centric potential vorticity advection at 500 hectopascals. Uh, so, the propagation vectors of LPS and CIMF models show a westward propagation instead of observed northwestward trajectory. It is found that a weaker potential vorticity advection causes the weaker and incoherent propagation of LPS in the CMF models. The core region of LPS genesis is also shifted northward, with the majority of them are forming over land in CMF models. So, figure 2 shows the lead light composite of uh, relative vorticity anomaly at 850 hectopascals. We can clearly uh, observe the difference in the signals in uh, different uh, genesis mechanisms of LPS. Earlier, I studied about the defining a new category named uncertain events. Panel E and panel C and F shows the uncertain, uh, the composite of uncertain events in which the both the genesis mechanisms are present. So, uh, figure 3 shows the uh, uh, monthly average frequency of downstream in situ and LPS uh, in uncertain LPS genesis mechanisms of era interim and uh, CMF models. So we observed a substantial intermodal variability, and all models have predominantly in situ mechanisms. Uh, so in line with the observations, the LPS genesis of downstream uh, the genesis of uh, downstream LPS happens too early in the monsoon, that means in the June, whereas it peaks uh, in August and September in the observations. Thank you so much. Okay, so if there are quick question, so if there is not, let's uh, move to the next speaker. Uh, list is showing me RP Menon. This is Achishman. So, uh, very good morning. Am I audible? Yeah. So may I have the slide, please? One minute. 
वन मिनट या ये पसंद है थैंक तो या आरती मेनन अच्छी हाय थैंक यू राजीव गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल आई एम आरती मेनोन फ्रॉम द यूके मेट ऑफिस आई विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट द स्ट्रक्चर एंड डायनामिक्स ऑफ ए के स्टडी मानसून डिप्रेशन इन हाई रेजोल्यूशन न्यूमेरिकल सिमुलेशन ऑफ द मेट ऑफिस यूनिफाइड मॉडल दिस वर्क इज डन विद अमरोजो वॉलंटे एंडी टर्नर एंड किरन हंड so uh, in this study we try to understand the detailed evolution of a case study monsoon depression uh, and its interactions with the surrounding air masses using high resolution uh, simulations of the metophis unified model so in this study we uh, mainly analyze two dynamical processes that uh, could affect the uh, evolution of the monsoon depression one is the role of mesoscale convective systems uh, and their interactions with the monsoon depression and the second one is the interaction of the dry air intrusions with the monsoon depression next slide please yeah uh, so for this study we uh, are looking at a monsoon depression that formed in july uh, 2016 we are mainly interested in this specific case because uh, during this period uh, we had a an intensive observing period in india as a part of the encompass project so we have some uh, flight measurements and uh, uh, ground station measurements of this uh, specific monsoon depression so to understand this depression in detail we did some nested suite uh, simulations using the metophis unified model at a resolution of 1.5 kilometers the simulation was done for a period of 1st to 10th july 2016 that was the period of that depression so uh, we mainly looked at uh, two mechanisms so uh, if you look at the figure on the left that shows the rainfall and 10 meter winds uh, on 3rd july 2016 so that was during the initial stage of the monsoon depression we can see that here the uh, red diamond towards the right that shows the center of the monsoon depression and one of the mcss is marked on the Uh, towards the west so during the initial stages of the monsoon depression where uh, the monsoon depression air was interacting with the uh, the um, other air masses from the boundary um, mesos there were lots of mesoscale convective systems which formed towards the west of the depression and we did some lagrangian trajectory analysis and we found that the high pv high theta e air from this monsoon depression uh, so sorry from the mesoscale convective systems were feeding into the uh, monsoon depression during the initial stages the figure on the right shows the rainfall and uh, winds on uh, 6th july 2016 that was during a later stage of the monsoon depression and the tephigram shown on the right is uh, from a location which is shown by that red star in that second map so uh, we can see that at around like 900 hectopascal 500 hectopascal etc there were there are dry air intrusions in this region um, so again we did uh, some lagrangian trajectory analysis and we found that these dry air intrusions at uh, different uh, levels are interacting with the monsoon depression Uh, bringing in uh, uh, low theta e low pv air into the depression and um, that can help in the dissipation of the depression um, so uh, in the interest of time i am not showing the lagrangian trajectory analysis and all here but uh, if you are interested in this please visit the poster thank you thank you arthi so if there is any quick question so please visit the poster if you are interested so we are moving to the next uh, speaker uh, achishman bara 
Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to present via this platform. Today, I am going to present on the topic characteristics of monsoon rainfall in last four decades over an urban area of the Gangetic Plain. The aim of this paper is to study the possible changes in the characteristics of precipitation during the Indian summer monsoon season over the urban areas of Patna, the capital city of the Bihar state, India, using the CHIRPS high resolution graded data set. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So for the study, uh, we have used the data set from the CHIRPS, which is a climate hazards group infrared precipitation station data and version 2.0 was considered. This data set was considered because this has a very high spatial resolution about 0 0.05 degrees. So to resolve the data over an urban area, the high resolution was a very prime factor for selection of the data sets. To delineate the urban area, we have used the very high resolution Copernicus CGLS LC100 land cover data set from Probavi satellite. This is a very uh, new wedge data set and around 25 times more higher spatial resolvability than the modest land cover products. The data is extracted over the urban area of city of Patna in Bihar using Google Earth Engine platform. Uh, because of the time constraints, I have uh, summarized only the key highlights of the research in this slide. I am requesting all to kindly visit my e-poster for the detailed analysis and the graphs and uh, <coughs> other plots. Okay, so for the current research, uh, we have sorted the daily uh, data, daily and for extracted data over the urban area of Patna uh, into two groups. One group having the low to moderate rainfall events or uh, up to 35.6 mm per day. And these are considered as a light rainy days. The number of days were calculated. The second bin is uh, comprised of the rather heavy to extremely heavy rainfall days, or uh, which is known as the heavy rainfall days during the last four decades, which is 1981 through 2021. And this analysis were made uh, to envisage the trend uh, during the month of June, July, August, and September individually. And uh, the key outcome of uh, the experiment was the all one showed a unique signature in the time series analysis and an increasing trend in light rainy days, which is also statistically significant using the man candle test, was found over Patna for the month of June and August. So this type of urbanization uh, based or focused on the urban area uh, studies are much required in the future and the changes in precipitation is much needed to be studied in the context of urban areas to address the issues of urban flooding and urban water resource management in the light of the changing climate and its responses in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is, there is some time for some question, if there is some question. Okay, so in the interest of time, let's move to the next uh, one. Avnish. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope I am audible. Yes, please go. Ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. So this is basically related to the change deduction analysis using the multi spectral satellite images using the machine learning framework. Uh, can you please go to the next slide? So here is a basically high level introduction of the uh, chain deduction mechanism. Normally we deal in the two types of the chain deduction using the multi temporal satellite images. Uh, one is one is using the multi class analysis. Second is the binary chain deduction. Here I will talk more on the binary chain deduction like in the yes and no format. So here mostly we worked on identifying the built up changes using the two point data set through on automated method. Now, what is the need of this exercise is because the built up change deduction is required for many application, including the uh, urban growth analysis and in the weather um, weather uh, analysis for we, we would be requiring for NWP model and impact based forecast. And there are many other applications. Now, how to delineate this changes because the time point creates a maximum problem for identifying the changes if we go with the one algorithm. 
However, through the post classification algorithm, classifying the one imagery and another imagery is quite simple. So we have developed a one framework which not only uh, generate the data automatically, but also save a lot of time for the manual cleaning, identifying the uh, outputs through our manual efforts. So what we have done over here, we have used a one framework, normalized difference built up index, which we have calibrated further and using the pre-processing technique, including the image to image registration and the histogram normalization, then we have uh, process it further using the machine learning algorithm for uh, for uh, converting the data into binary changes. Now this will help us in many ways. Now nowadays people are trying to use the deep learning method, but it requires a significant amount of data set. But if we talk about the remote sensing data set, especially like the application chain detection, then our data set is quite narrow. And to feed about this data set in the deep learning models requires a numerous amount of data set. So what we have done is to generate the data set for the deep learning algorithm, this exercise is also we have developed using the machine learning, classical machine learning algorithms. So can you move to the next slide, sir? So this is the data set we have used, uh, uh, TM images of 2000 and 2010, Landsat 8 images of 2013 and 2021, and we have uh, collected all the bands uh, around that, and we have uh, developed one framework out of it. Next slide, please. So this is a basically um, a normalized difference built up index for 2000 and 2010, and similarly for 2013 and 2021, which basically required the uh, uh, MIR and NIR band combination versus the near uh, near infrared and the red band uh, uh, combinations out of it. And then finally, we are taking the difference out of it. Next slide, please. So once we are having our NDVI images of date one and date two, we need to, what we have done, we have take the difference out of it. Now, here we have applied the machine learning algorithm. Now to split this data set further to binary changes like zero and one format, we use a multi OSU algorithm, which basically works on the histogram local minima versus the local maxima. This outputs are which uh, is highlighted over here in the Landsat 5 versus the Landsat 8 is developed automatically and it's working on the different different satellite images. So right now I'm showing over here as a Landsat images, but it's working pretty fine for the Sentinel uh, two images as well for the 10 meter resolutions. Next slide, please. So this is a basically high level summary of this work is we have implemented this data set uh, uh, algorithm for Landsat 5 and Landsat 8, even for the Sentinel uh, 2 satellite, optical satellite images. This data set not only helping us for uh, predicting, predicting the, and. Uh, NWP forecast better. Also, it will help us for the impact based forecast as well. And this data set, we will slowly, slowly move further for the deep learning model when we implement the entire network and, or we will train the entire network using the CNN based approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Avnish. So, in the interest of time, let's move to the next speaker, Sayed Hamid Ali. Are you there? Sayad Hamid Ali, uh, we can't hear you. If you are here, please start your presentation. Yeah. 
sir we will go to next translation okay yeah. yeah let's move to the next one then gokul vishwanathan Gopur Vishwanathan, if you are here, am I audible, sir? Yeah, now you are audible. Okay, uh, sorry, sir. Uh, can we go to the next? Yeah, please start. Uh, I can't hear. Google is already muted. Unmuted. We can't hear you, Google. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Sir. We can't hear you yet, Gopun. Sir, I think we can go to the next presentation yeah. and we can come back to Google later. Yeah. Hello. How about now, sir? Gokul, uh, we are intermittently hearing you sometimes. It is uh, so if you have. Uh, uh, can I get back to you soon? Sir? I mean, after the last. I'll just check my. Yeah, I think then we move to the next presentation uh, and then yes. uh, if you have it is issue is sorted out, we'll see. So next one is Pragna Vyadarshini. Please start. Uh, uh, I can't hear, so. Sir, I think Prajana Priyadarshini has in joined the meeting. Okay, okay. So then let's move to the next speaker then. Saurav Varma. Are you there, Saurav? Saurav? I don't, I can't see him also. Yes, so then we can go more to the next one. So next is Somendu De. Uh, I don't see him also. Is so many do they?
So what shall we do? Move to next. Mr. Usnan Shudatta, are you here? I don't see him in the presentation. So, Mr. Gokul, if you want to present, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So please share Mr. Gokul's presentation and me. Uh, sir, meanwhile, we can go to uh, Hashmi Fatima's presentation, Dr. Hashmi Fatima from NCMRW. Uh, good morning, everyone. Shall I share my screen? OK. Hello, can you share, see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hashmi Farima. I am from NCR WF. So today I'm going to present about the land surface variability during summer monsoon period. So here I have uh, assessed the soil moisture during monsoon 2020 and compared with the IMRA reanalysis data. And uh, the time period is June to September 2020. In the reanalysis data, I have uh, taken at uh, one hourly, uh, one hour, at one hourly, and it is at 12 kilometer resolution. So this, these pictures are from IMD. This is the progress of Southwest Monsoon 2020, and here we see that uh, it was a good monsoon. Uh, the, uh, the excess rainfall we have got in Southern Pansar region and uh, normal rainfall over Central Indian region. And uh, if we see uh, the uh, monthly averages from IMD merged observed rainfall, we see uh, that uh, rainfall is increasing in July and good rainfall we have got in August. And uh, if uh, I see from India analysis data, uh, it shows some less amount of uh, rainfall than the ob observed uh, uh, IMD observed rainfall. And uh, this is uh, the comparison. The first picture is from the uh, IMDA, the layer one picture. Uh, this is for the layer one picture. And this is uh, um, uh, from the uh, uh, our model, uh, soil moisture analysis picture. And this is day one forecast, day five, day uh, seven forecast. And uh, we see here as uh, um, uh, this, uh, 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 this part, uh, Northwest region, uh, the model uh, has uh, captured uh, this, uh, but uh, we see that uh, the model has more wet than the INDA uh, soil moisture. And uh, this is uh, for, for July 2020. And uh, here also we see that uh, um, uh, model is more wet uh, than the INDA uh, soil moisture in layer one. Uh, this is uh, for August 2020. Uh, here, uh, model shows good amount of sand, uh, soil moisture over Central India region in the analysis. And uh, as we go from day one to day three, day five, and day seven, uh, the soil moisture is uh, decreasing. And during September also, uh, this soil moisture uh, is uh, decreasing with the forecast lead time in the model, but uh, if we compare with the India analysis data, model is uh, showing more uh, soil moisture over Central India region than the India analysis data. So here I conclude that uh, uh, during June, Central Indian region was having low soil moisture because of high temperature. But as the monsoon progresses from south to north, soil moisture is increasing in July and August. Uh, and the uh, model is able to capture the spatial features of soil moisture and rainfall with the inter-analysis data. 
uh, but Mavic seems to be more wet than the IMDA analysis. So in the future work, we would like to include IMDA data as the meteorological forcing input to the model to see its impact on soil moisture forecast. Any questions? Okay, so if there is no more question, then uh... can I have one quick question just? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Achha, ask me this: uh, the IMDA rainfall analysis and uh, what other uh, that uh, merge rainfall analysis? How it is different? Is it uh, miss? Okay, did you get the question? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, that was uh, IMDA analysis and also you answered you are doing the merge re merge re rainfall data, na? Yes. So how 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 it is different? Uh, have to compare or whether it is same? No, we have to compare like winds and other factors also. Uh, hmm. uh, the turbulent heat fluxes also. Then we uh, could say anything about this. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay, thank you. Okay, so another, I think another one was from NCMIW. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Start. Can I start, sir? Hello, yeah, can start. I start, sir? Okay, uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Sir. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gokul Vishwanathan, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Uh, today, I will be talking about the interaction of dry air incursion with monsoon depression originating over the Bay of Bengal. Uh, what we mean here by dry incursion is basically the presence of your dry air uh, over the Northwest Indian region uh, available at 700, 400 hectopascal, uh, as you could see in this in the first figure. Uh, to this effort, we use the IMDA, ira and the IMD graded rainfall product available from 1982 to 2012. Uh, uh, in this study, we basically uh, tend to divide your or tend to distinguish or isolate between your uh, depression and deep depression events separately as compared to what our previous studies have done where they consider both your depression and deep depression events under the same branch of monsoon depressions. And uh, for drier incursion data, this work was complemented from past work, which was done by Jennifer Fletcher in the 18th, in the year 2018. Uh, we also to get a more regionalized perspectives for this interaction between your dry air incursion and monsoon depression, we basically focus on four different regions, uh, mainly at R1, which is your uh, depression core zone, your R2, your dry air mass region, your R3 is your western guards, and R4 is your southeastern uh, region, which is which is just the rain shadow zone for your R3. Uh, next slide. Uh, we divide our results basically on, on four, based on four different categories. So your first category is your uh, deep depression events uh, without dryer incursion and with dryer incursion. And we have your depression events without dryer incursion and with dryer incursion separately for ERA-5, IMDA and IMD graded rainfall product. So the first key highlight which we find in this work is that most of your, uh, if you see for all the cases, your IMDA rainfall spatial map matches really closely with your IMD graded rainfall products. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, it matches very closely with your IMD graded rainfall product, which is quite nice because your IMDA could actually identify or distinguish between your deep depression and depression events quite nicely, which is actually not the case for ERA-5 because it tends to have a stronger wet bias uh, for depression events with drier incursion. Uh, there were also other significant features which we found in this study, especially over your Western Guards region, which you can find in the second second plot, where you could find that the low level convergence uh, for depression events when it interacts with your drier incursion is very low as compared to your depression events when it interacts with your drier incursion. So, so overall, what we could understand is that IMDA could actually represent your monsoon features quite realistically, whereas your ERA-5 tends to exaggerate your uh, monsoon circulation features. 
and uh, also the fact that uh, IMDA could actually isolate between your depression and deep depression events, whereas ERA-5 could actually not distinguish between those two uh, cyclonic systems uh, separately. Uh, for more uh, information, I request everyone to look into our posture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rupul. So, if is there any quick question? So, if not, then uh, uh, may I, if anyone uh, I have missed in the list uh, because there are many other names also. To, so, if anyone is present here, yes, sir. Uh, so if there are no additional presentations here Sir, I'm not yes. hearing you. Yes. Yeah, so I was saying that uh, if anyone is uh, in this session, there are 16 names, but there are total 23 participants. So anyone who wants to present, if we have missed someone, then you can present. If not, then uh, and if there may be questions. Uh, so the e posters are available. Uh, in the in the IMD link that is given in the chat box. So, so thank you all, and uh, I now hand over the dash to the admin for further announcements. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Yes, so e poster and those who have submitted the video also available. So detail okay. uh, as they were telling detailed uh, video if they want to see it is available. So that will be there, so people can visit and see. I think this this nicely maintained the time also. So our time was just about one and a half, 15 minutes. And this is good. So everybody has got opportunity to explain the main result. Our detail can be seen from poster and also through personal correspondence. Thank you very much. With this, we conclude our the forenoon session, local forenoon session of today. And again, we have evening invited and parallel sessions so see you till that time so uh, six, that is 6 6 pm and that is 12 30 utc thank you very much